Any time. All right, we're recording. Go ahead, Andy. Okay, so I'm going to uh, call the Finance Committee meeting to order at 9 a.m. on May 26, 2022, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance and members of the public has been committed, but every effort is being made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceeding in real time via technological means. Um, I'm going to proceed to go through the um, committee list again, uh, by, alphabetically by uh, last name and um, make sure that each member of the committee can signify that they can hear and um, by their response, we know we can hear them to assure their participation. So um, let's start with Lynn. Present. Bob. Present. Uh, Matt, we said is not present and, oh, Matt is here now. Matt. Matt, can you hear us? Andy, I'm here. I'm sorry. Give me one second. Okay, that's okay. You got it. Um, Bernie? I'm here. Michelle? Hey, everybody. Here. Uh, Kathy? Here. And Alicia? Here. Okay, so all members of the committee are present and all have signified that they've been able to hear and we've heard the response. Uh, so um, it, I want to make sure that Anna can hear us, even though we don't have a quorum. Good morning. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, keep an eye out if we get any additional attendance from members of the, uh, the council and need to call it as a council meeting in addition. Um, the agenda today is to complete the presentations of departments and uh, when we, we will, that is the first um, agenda item to discuss. And uh, then there were some general questions who were posed by one member of the council that uh, Sean is going to, uh, um, See if he can tell us what they were um, and address them to the best that he can. And uh, the, um, we will build public comment into the um, agenda um, somewhere along the way, probably around that point. And then we're going to conclude by seeing if there are um, any definite requests by two members of the committee four items for consideration on Monday. We will start Monday by making that uh, possibility, or Tuesday rather, Tuesday's meeting the 31st. Uh, we will go back to do that again on Tuesday, but to the extent that we can identify issues today, that would be helpful for preparation purposes. Um, then we have one more member of the council who's uh, joined us Jennifer, do you want to make? Yes, uh, Jennifer, can you hear us? I can hear you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, with Jennifer's arrival, I want to call uh, the town council to order for the committee of the whole meeting in relationship to the finance committee meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So with that and having reviewed the agenda, are there any questions to, about the agenda itself? Um, and, uh, I'm aware, Michelle, that you have um, questions about future agenda placement of some issues and um, that uh, will be uh, when we get back to setting the agenda for um, next week and after we will get back to that, but I just wanted to acknowledge it. Um, so uh, turning it to uh, Sean, because you have an order established that you would, you've arranged with our staff and uh, I'll let you take 
take the lead there. Thanks, Andy. Um, so Jeremiah LaPlante, our facility manager is here. He's going to lead us through the sort of general government facility section and also the police facilities. Um, and for those who are following in the budget document, the general facility starts on page 106, um, the, the, the snapshot of the department. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeremiah. Morning, Jeremiah. Yes, so as Sean said that I'm going to be discussing general government and APD uh, budget. And I think uh, uh, good news is, is not a lot has changed with our, our operational budget for those two, two areas. Uh, and this is, comes um, with our, our look to the future um, with expanding and welcoming uh, the addition uh, to the North Amherst Library. Uh, finance and I are following some trends, uh, particularly in the utilities. Uh, at APD, we have seen a decrease in our electric uh, bill, and I can say that that's safely say that that's probably attributed to some of the upgrades that we've we've done through the Green Communities uh, program. Um, over at Bangs Community Center, we, we've seen. Uh, a fairly sharp increase in our water uh, uh, usage. Uh, but I think this is, even though it sounds negative, I really believe that it is a positive. Um, this, is, this results uh, from the increase in programming and the New Santee Center Health Center becoming much more active. Um, this, this increase comes at a time uh, where we are really seeing the Banks Community Center sort of transition from a community center to more of a, a social service center. Um, we have the senior center, the health center, public health, and eventually we're gonna see the CREST program. So we, we see this transition happening. Um, so yes, we are, we are seeing an increase in the utilities, but it really is a positive. The Banks Community Center is, is brightening up and we have all these wonderful programs there. Uh, moving on to some of projects that we have, uh, we're closing out FY22. We had a, a bunch of projects that we completed and we're, in, in, uh, we're working on. Over at uh, the North Fire Station, we upgraded all of the garage bay doors, uh, making it much more weather tight, um, increasing our efficiencies. Uh, we're exp expanding the building access controls across five different buildings. And this allows for greater flexibility and security in our municipal buildings. Uh, we're working on repointing uh, a bunch of town hall. Uh, this will help with our, gran our granite fascias. Uh, uh, we have a Bangs accessibility uh, improvement, and this is through our MOD grant that we were awarded. So the whole front uh, section of Bangs is being reworked to make it uh, more accessible and to clean up uh, some of the findings that we had through that accessibility report. Um, and we're developing, developing and renovating the third floor of Bangs for the Crest program, which is really exciting uh, to welcome them into the building. Uh, looking towards FY23, um, that'll look like HVAC at Munson, uh, HVAC in North Amherst. And one of the biggest projects uh, that we're focusing on is replacing the chiller over at the police department. That, that'll be one of our, our big focuses. All of these will be done through um, our in-house and, and trying to uh, capture as, as much funding as we can through math saves. All this, all, all this year, Mass Saves is offering wonderful rebates for upgrading and eliminating fossil fuels. So we, we really need to uh, uh, do, do our best to, to utilize those and, and sort of get back some of this, this money. Um, so that's, that's a quick snapshot of, of uh, the budget and all the projects. Is there any questions for me? Andy, there were some questions sent in that maybe I, um, Jeremiah, I don't know if you have that in front of you, but I can read them if you don't. Yes. Okay, who is I don't the, have them in front of me. Who is the one who sent uh, Michelle sent them in. Hmm? 
Michelle sent them in. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the first one, Jeremiah, is there a plan to update the facilities inventory report? Yes. Yes, there, there isn't a plan to update that. Um, this, this year, the focus is 12, 12 buildings. So there's, I believe, 60 or 63 buildings in total on that report. Um, so just sort of uh, picking away at it, um, I have 12 that are in works now, and each year, each year I will build, build upon that. Some of them will go a lot quicker than others. Um, so the 12 I have now, are, I would have to say, are probably some of the bigger ones, so. Okay. How do you expect deferred maintenance of, uh, how do you expect the deferred maintenance of buildings? Um, how will that impact the budget in coming years? Well, I, I think if we keep focusing on some of these larger projects and getting some of those uh, 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 taken care of, then this, the, I would imagine or I'd anticipate some of these deferred, these deferred projects, capital projects to sort of lessen. So I know that right now um, our, our capital budget is quite large. And as we move on, you see that decreasing. And that, that is a, just really a result of prioritizing some of these big projects and making sure that we get them taken care of. And just adding to that, um, not everyone here is on JCPC. So we do have a um, line item uh, that we've sort of been increasing a little bit each year, um, that sort of general facility maintenance and is to tackle these deferred maintenance projects as they come up. Um, and so Jeremiah's done a good job of sort of listing out what's on his radar. Uh, are there general ideas about meeting our climate goals within facilities? So um, Jeremiah, I know you, you think about that a lot. I, I do, I do. I'm, I'm always thinking about that with any of the projects that, that I'm, I'm trying to tackle. I have Stephanie right beside me and uh, she, is, she is my best resource. Her and I collaborate on a lot of these. I ask her, you know, if there are any things that I can do uh, uh, to help us um, achieve these goals. Um, it, it really is on my mind. So I, I just work with all these, all the different individuals uh, to ensure that I am, because we really do need to push. We need, we need to push as far as we can with every project. So it is important. So Andy, there's a number of hands raised. We have one more facilities question, but probably go to the questions first. Okay, and uh, as always, um, recognize any questions from members of the council and members of the finance committee in order that hands appear. Anna? Yeah, mine's actually a, a quick comment. Um, thank you, Jeremiah. That's really helpful to Michelle's two questions. One of the things that I'm working on with uh, the chair of ECAC as their liaison is ensuring that the categories we're asking for in those inventory reports align and give us the information we need on JCPC to make those decisions. And so that's something that I'm working on a memo that you'll see um, that I'm going to send to finance once we've wrapped it up. So um, I think Jeremiah and Stephanie are doing a great job. And I, I think there's some additional things we can continue to do on our inventories um, to give us that a little bit more info than we've gotten in the past to make those decisions. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Lynn? I would actually be fine if we go ahead and deal with the last question and then come back. And Kathy, did you have something you want to raise now? You're not, you're muted, but I'm assuming that. I'm the same as Lynn, that I, I'm fine with the last question. I have uh, some different questions. So let me see whether Lynn, and Michelle okay. asked one of them. Okay, uh, what was so the last question then, Chad? Yeah, the last one is, are there specific challenges with respect to the disability access in our facilities? Um, I would say one of the challenges is, is probably prioritizing. Uh, and, and, and part of it is, is prioritizing not only the need for um, the, 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 the individuals who are utilizing our, our buildings, but also uh, it's, there's a financial piece to this. Uh, there, 
an example could be um, maybe an elevator door that's slightly narrower. I mean, maybe, you know, it's supposed to be 36 inches and it's 35. It, though that's something that you would have to look at and, and weigh it as a priority going, is this, is, is this the best use of the money or is there others? And I, I just use that as, as one example. I, I mean, there's signage that's, that's uh, cited. There's uh, transitions that are, that are cited. So it's, I think one of the challenges is, is just prioritizing that. So I'm always trying to look for what is our, our, what is the greatest need and sort of what is the, the biggest bang for the buck. We, we, wanna, we wanna have the funding that, that we have set aside go as far as possible. Um, and, and really that, that's, I would say that's a challenge. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lynn, back to you. Okay, I'm gonna apologize in advance if this is a little long-winded for me. Um, we have recently had a couple of situations where abandoned buildings, if you will, buildings that we are not using to have people in them, um, are, have come up. You know, one, for example, came from the Conservation Commission. Uh, another one is under the purview of the Conservation Commission. That's the, another one is the South Amherst School, okay? So as we, as the town, continue to, I'm sorry to say this, have people dump abandoned property on us, leaving us with the maintenance challenge. I think it is important that we have a policy about whether or not we're willing to accept some of these buildings because then people get mad at us for not using scarce town dollars to maintain them. And then somebody says, oh, I wanna use that building. And now we go out and we look at that building and we say, well, it's gonna cost X, Y, Z amount to use that building. And then you know, one of my colleagues pipes up and says, well, why didn't we maintain that building to begin with? So this is a longer range issue. You know, we recently, for example, voted a couple of years ago on East Street School. We actually gave it forward to the housing authority or the housing uh, trust, and they're now making use of it by having it rehabbed at some level and added to. But the acceptance of buildings by the town is leading to us having a bunch of really badly in need of repair buildings on our books. And I want to figure out how we deal with that, whether or not we should accept those. Maybe we don't have the option. And if we do have the option, what should we do? And what should be our attitude towards the ongoing maintenance of buildings that other people have basically said, we can no longer use these to inhabit people with the people. So a little energized over the issue. Thank you. Alicia is in the attendees. Good. Pardon? Alicia is in the attendees. Thanks, I'm bringing her in. Okay. Alicia, you're back. Um, Lynn, 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 I, I just want to uh, you, quickly uh, to that, and I, and I know that um, I've been working with uh, cl closely with Dave and Dave and Rob and Paul on, on this, and, and I would I'd have to say that you know for for my piece of it, for the facilities piece is is looking at some of the major systems, major utility systems, and trying to maintain those as well as, as, well as I can, uh, uh, because. Like most things, if they're if they're left to sit, then it's much much harder to sort of spark the life back into it. So it's a lot easier um, to keep some of those major systems going, and then modifying the rest, so so that there is not an, an ongoing uh, expense. So it, that's that's really my have has been my approach, but I, but I agree. There is, there is a, a bigger conversation, a broader conversation that, that should, should happen. Paul? Yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, so I think, Lynn, you identified an important 
comment, which was, these are buildings that were um, determined by the school committee that they are no longer needed for educational use. Then they um, go back to the town as ownership. It's not like they're giving it to it. It just re it reverts to the town for our ownership. Typically, buildings are move away from them because people have deferred maintenance previously, or that um, there is no need for them, be, or because the expense it's so expensive to bring them back up to code or whatever would need be, need to be done to them. Uh, the same happened with the Hitchcock Center, which is um, on conservation land. It was our land that was used by the Hitchcock Center when they built their new headquarters. They said, we don't need that building anymore. We prioritize our capital, our, our very you know, we're very frugal with our capital funds and we put those into buildings that we are using. We don't put the money into uh, abandoned buildings basically until there's a need. We look for creative reuse of buildings like we did with the East Street School. And we're happy that that's being reutilized as a, a for affordable housing. Um, but then when we go to look at these buildings and Hickory is another one, it's a building that we're, we purchased, um, but we know that it, it has, it's, has its own weaknesses and the you know, building commissioner has, has already done, gone through it along with the fire inspectors. Um, you know, there are some, they become liabilities. Um, and so I think that that's something that we are aware of, but when we get a building that we can use actively reuse, like the North Amherst School, that's actively being reused uh, for a daycare center and for, and for um, archival storage for personnel records and things like that. Sure. Lynn, do you have any follow-up before I go on? I'll have more later. Okay, Kathy? Um, I would, I, I just wanna underscore, I agree with Lynn, I think we need a policy um, and, Paul, I, I don't disagree with anything that you just said. You know, we, we, it's, easy, it's easier to accept and then four or five years later figure out what we're gonna do with it. Um, you know, I was struck by the um, old Hitchcock Center that we're paying for the demolition of it as an example. I guess we knew that was coming. So I have completely unrelated questions. Um, the, um, the health center that's in the bank center, do they pay us rent? Yes. And does that show up? I, I see there's rental contracts. So somewhere in the budget, there's rent. It's in the, it's in the rent line item in the, um, in the revenue section of the budget. It's, they're one of our, the, uh, one of our renters. Okay. You know, and it just, you know, Jeremiah, you um, said we're transforming bangs from a community center to social service. I think it's partly during COVID there were some steps and pre-COVID we brought in the health center and that was pre the council. But are we, is there a plan when we lose the community space to say Jones is gonna be our community space, Jones Library, which will have a community room if we lose the community room in Bangs, would we have to pay rent to Jones if, and you may not know the answer. I know Jones is not on your list. Um, so that's a second question related to the loss of one kind of use and where we see the second. And then my only other one is on, this is a, a picky one, but on utilities, you listed a lot of buildings that are in the utility. Is the North Little North Amherst Library also in that list? It's just, it's missing from the list. The, the, library, the library pays those utilities. Now that may be changing in the future. Okay. Um, okay. So that's, that's why they, that's why the maintenance and things like that have never been part of our capital reports. Okay. Um, okay. Fine. Cause I know we're one of the things with the gift is that, that it's an upgrade of those, um, right. the HVAC system that should lower utility. So yeah. we wouldn't, we won't see the we won't see that one way or the other in our budget. Not right now, but again, that may be changing in the future where you might see it going forward at a certain point. Okay, that that's my question. Um, and I just want to say, underscore, I think what Anna and others said, Jeremy Maya came to us with an amazing list um, at JCPC where some that addressed some of Michelle's where it's five to 10 years of a plan on when are we doing which HVAC system? When are we doing which things? So you, you can see a, on climate action um, and, and upgrades, what's on the list or what isn't on the list. So it's probably a good thing to somehow flag when we write this report, just cross-reference it to a page because it was extremely thoughtful on um, this notion of 
there is a larger maintenance list as well as well as a climate action list with a, a really good. And I, I just thought you've done an amazing job, Jim, Jeremiah. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Paul and Dave both have hands up, so I don't know which do you between the two of you to respond to yeah, some go, of the Go with Dave first, I think. Okay, Dave. Thanks, Andy. I'll be very brief. I just wanted to build on what Paul said. Um, you know, listening to this conversation and others like it that have happened over the last couple of months, I think um, part of it might be really um, more a communication uh, gap uh, between staff and and committees and boards about some of these buildings. Um, you know, we we talk about them often. I work with Rob, Jeremiah. Chris Brestrup um, in the planning department, and of course, Paul. And uh, so, so I think we need to do a better job at communicating kind of what some of the vision uh, might be for these properties. And, and maybe that's part of the, the disconnect here. Um, um, you know, these decisions to, to mothball, if you will, some of these buildings were you know, have been very deliberate. East Street School, South Amherst Campus, uh, South Amherst School, as I like to call it, not campus. Um, as Paul said, uh, we've we've made deliberate decisions not to invest in those buildings, uh, or at least parts of those buildings, because um, they are so expensive to maintain, um, and and we don't think some of them have a long term future. But the land that they sit on is very valuable. And, and Paul referenced the East Street School property. Um, if we hadn't maintained or, or invested minimally in the East Street School property or had divested of it, um, the Wayfinders project for 70 new units of housing never would have happened. So, so there is a plan. I think we need to do a little bit better job communicating to the council and, and to various boards and committees. Um, South Amherst campus is a great example excuse me, South Amherst School is a great example. Um, um, we think part of that building could be salvaged. It's very historic, but the south end of the building probably doesn't need to be. But the land that it sits on could be something very creative for the town. It could be another housing project in the future. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there, um, that there are plans, if you will, um, and we need to do a better job at communicating to you all what those might be and, and get feedback and input from, from various boards and committees and, and the council. So thanks. Is there, um, while you're here, is there a quick explanation of the history of the Hitchcock Center building and which sits on conservation land as to, how, to who built the building originally? Did it revert, was it built by the town? Yeah, sure. Very quick. Sure, Andy, the quick, quick skinny on the Hitchcock Center building. So um, Larch Hill, the conservation area at Larch Hill, which is associate, you know, adjacent to the common school is maybe the oldest piece of um, the first uh, or second piece of conservation land the town ever purchased. We collaborated with the common school um, to purchase the land. The common school was looking for a place to, to live and be. And um, the town collaborated at that time, this was 50 odd years ago with an organization called the Long Plain Nature Center, which eventually morphed into the Hitchcock Center for the Environment. Um, so the town bought the land that the Hitchcock Center sits on. That was a, a barn, essentially a carriage house for the house that the common school is in. Common school has since um, expanded their, their buildings and their, their footprint. Um, and the Hitchcock Center lived there, operated out of there for 50 odd years, as Paul said, before they built their new building down at Hampshire College. So we've owned it for 50 years. It was, uh, there were two additions to it, one in the 80s and then one in the 90s. Um, but again, this is a very old barn building, poorly insulated. If any of you ever took, had programs at the Hitchcock Center or went there, it's a lovely old building, but it is not a building that we ever intended to invest in. Um, it's an old barn. And when you walk in there, there's no insulation. The HVC, HVAC system is extremely old. The, the, the basement fills up with water. It's on an old septic system. All of these things that we in facilities and, and planning know, 
and that's why we we came to the conclusion um, some years ago that when when Hitchcock was going to move out, that that building was not a good investment for the town. It does sit on conservation land, so it is highly restricted what can happen with the building or the land. So the movement is toward removing that, um, removing that structure, repurposing some of the old timbers, et cetera, and, um, and, and uh, that land would revert to simply being part of the conservation area that it is part of and has been for 50 odd years. So hope that helps. Okay, no, that does, thank you. Paul? Well, Thanks. I'm glad, Dave, that was one of my suggestions was to get the history of the Hitchcock Center. Two things. One is I want to second uh, Kathy's that we're really fortunate to have Jeremiah on our team now. Um, he's been spectacular at sort of analyzing every building. And, you know, the previous facilities report was a pretty quick snapshot of what was there. He's doing an intense deep dive on every building. So we really know what we're dealing with. And I really appreciate, and it's, a, you say 12 buildings in a year because he's got a million other jobs on his plate. So getting this in and having a target of that, I think is really a, a good plan. The other thing I want to mention is, is the Banks Community Center, um, the the second floor, which used to hire, um, it was used to hold offices for the Center for New Americans and for Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Um, those uh, leases were termed, and then that's why we have that space available for the Crest program. These are offices that are now being transferred into offices um, for town purposes. So that was not, you know, this is not sort of program space that we used previously. Uh, the one space that was taken out of circulation was the poll room, which you heard people talk about at, um, sometimes with the seniors center will say that's a difficult room to utilize for dances and stuff because there are poles in the room. Um, but that's now been dedicated to our um, Civil War tablets, which has um, become sort of a real magnet for people to visit. So th losing that room has been significant. Um, and I think the other frustration with the bank center is that it's been used as a community center. Um, so there is, you know, one of the things you'll hear from the seniors center um, folks is that there isn't dedicated space for seniors um, as opposed to space that they can reserve. And then that's a major difference in how they're able to operate. And then the last thing I want to mention is that yeah. in many of these situations, we're very opportunistic um, in terms of, you know, having the East Street School build, you know, um, putting that together with the space, the, the land on Belcher Town Road, let us build, get a big enough project that enticed some developers to come in. Either one of them by themselves wasn't attractive enough or big enough to attract a good developer. Together, they made sense. So sometimes we hold on to these buildings and, you know, um, always are looking for future uses of them until something becomes economically viable. Okay, thank you. Bernie. Uh, two observations. One, <clears throat> another term for deferred maintenance is broken. So um, we need to really, and I'm glad, Jeremiah, I'm glad you're watching that because um, that's always a problem. Uh, the other thing is uh, we should not be afraid to bring the bulldozer. Um, I think we got lucky with East Street School. I think we may have had other prospects had that building not existed in that space. I'm glad people were able to reuse it. But when, when I walk by the uh, the, uh, the, the South Amherst School, because I live down here, I'm um, looking at it and I'm wondering why are we saving it? Because we could be using that for something that's even more immediate and more necessary, like housing. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to know that we're willing to, to take down old structures and not simply uh, as a sort of knee-jerk reaction try to save. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia? Um, thank you. I'm wondering um, if there is, um, I've heard mentioned before, a property disposition committee that looks into these kinds of things um, and whether or not they have a process in which like we will be able to pretty much like stay on top of these things and not be determining them after the building's already abandoned per se and just sitting there and that we have like a forward thinking plan ahead of time is what I would think that that committee would be doing. Um, because while I, I do agree with Bernie and that there are some properties that we probably shouldn't be keeping um, in terms of our finances, there are probably also some properties that may be more um, financially responsible for us to invest in rather than having the bill for a completely 
like the demolition and a new building. And if there are a committee or peoples that keep track of those things. Uh, Dave? Thank you, Alicia. Yes, um, there is a committee. It, it's not in a formal form, but but it includes myself and and Rob and the planning staff and 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 Jeremiah. But I I do think going back to my earlier comments about communication, I think um, bringing that group together. Uh, this we we created some structure around this i believe just probably in the year or so before the council uh before the change in government so as the select board was was nearing its its uh, end uh they adopted i believe a policy a, um, a surplus uh, property policy which included um a a group of of uh, staff uh, looking at these buildings and reporting out on them. So I think, I think m my earlier comments are, are kind of stand that we should do a better job of communicating to, to um, committees and boards as well as the council on some of the analysis of these buildings and then our recommendations for what to, to use them for. So whether it's uh, Hitchcock Center or uh, East Street or uh, South Amherst School, um, yes, we will we will do that in the coming year. Okay. Um, I mean, since I was on that select board, yes, we did pass that surplus building policy, and I might look for it and at least get it out to the finance committee uh, so that. It, uh, and Lynn can decide whether to go to the full council. Um, but it was adopted by the select board when I was on the select board. Um, anything else on uh, facilities, uh, Jeremiah? This is, um, or did you have, uh, you've really covered the police station. There was nothing else you wanted to say about the police station? Um. I, th I think that's it, just that, that we are looking at the police station and, and focusing on uh, replacing those that big system over there, um, the chiller. That's just the priority. Um, and we'll continue to watch the utilities and hopefully continue to watch them go down. Everybody thinks that it's a new building, but it's actually getting some age now. Yeah. Um, so if, is there anything else on facilities? I'll go one last round to see if any hands go up. And if not, uh, then I'll turn it back to Sean to move us to the next step. Uh, Lynn? Uh, first of all, again, Jeremiah, thank you. I think we know more about our facilities today than we've ever known. And uh, we know more about particularly uh, uh, plans going forward that support um, sustainability. And Michelle, thank you for your questions. I think they were excellent and right on. Um, I just need to be brought up to date. Did we replace the roof on the uh, police station? And no, if there's, a, there's a project to, and then I think it's next year on the capital plan of the year after um, to request funds for the roof. Okay. And does the cost for that project also then include mounting solar on that roof? Um, Jeremiah can weigh in more on this. I think it remains to be seen. We're doing that solar assessment right now um, with Stephanie, where they're looking at municipal facilities and determining which ones are good candidates for solar. Um, I've heard some, uh, you know, different opinions on whether the police station is actually a good site for solar. So, um, but that assessment should be done by the end of June, where we'll have a good, a better sense. Jeremiah, you may have more information on that. N not in really any more than that, um, but we do have funding set aside for the engineering study that would also support uh, that. So if we, um, it, it is it is absolutely something that we are considering. Um, but but I I felt that uh, uh, moving or, or sort of trading the place of the chiller and the roof was was important. Uh, the more immediate need is the chiller. Uh, and then I see the roof as a secondary um, to, to that to that project. Thank you. Jeremiah, thank you very much. Really appreciate it uh, and appreciate all of the work that you're doing. So thank you. 
Thank you. Um, Sean? Thanks. So, um, so Jennifer Brown from the health department is going to go next. Okay. Jennifer, hi. Thank you. You're muted, Jennifer. You're muted. Uh... Thank you so much. Um, good to be here. I'm Jennifer Brown. I'm the health director and still the public health nurse. Um, I just want to give a brief overview of what the health department does, and then I'm going to highlight three important things. The function of the health department is to promote health and well-being of the Amherst community, and we do that through five major service areas. Um, the first is assurance to make sure that people have access to health care. This is something that was really important during COVID, um, something we did well and very proud of, that we were able to link residents um, to receive the appropriate services and supplies that they needed. Second thing is infectious disease control. Obviously, we have COVID, and we'll talk more about that, but there's other things that go on in, in town. We've definitely had less infectious disease. There's been less transmission, but we still have rabies, and we have a good working relationship with the Amherst Police Department with that, and we have foodborne illnesses, and we thank Rob Mora and his team for um, uh, inspections of restaurants and, and contact tracing for that. Um, we provide health promotion, um, different services and educational pieces to um, residents. For example, ticks um, are, are being identified as a real issue. And we sure see that with a number of Lyme disease cases that we have. Health policy continues and thank you, Board of Health. We have five members there. Um, we look at our existing um, <clears throat> regulations, uh, make amendments to them, um, and uh, continue um, as new things are added. For example, tobacco is something we continue to, to work on. And then emergency preparedness. Um, so that's something that um, we've always had good community partners um, with to help us with. Um, so for example, the HPHPC, that's the Hampshire Public Health Preparedness, um, our EM. EMS system, um, Tim Nelson, the fire department. Um, we really have been prepared public health to expand and contract if there was an emergency. And that's what we did during COVID. We really had great teams working to make sure that we could do what we needed to do during this um, <clears throat> ongoing pandemic. I wanna move into th three initiatives. I'm just highlighting these. There are definitely other ones. One thing I think we'd like to continue to see um, the Amherst Health Department uh, do is continue our COVID vaccination clinics. When we started a year ago, we were the game in town, you know, along with our partners, UMass and other health departments, but we provided 17,000 vaccinations. Now it's very different. Um, <clears throat> for example, we can call the Bay State um, bus and they'll come up to the schools and provide vaccine. But we really have an emphasis um, and a duty to eliminate health disparities. So that's something that we take very seriously. How are we gonna help vulnerable populations? And that's where the health department will come in um, <clears throat> with our vaccinations. Um, I like to continue our rapid antigen tests. Um, we don't have the community PCR. I love rapid antigens and continue, hope to continue to get them from the state. Um, you know, as we are moving to a model of uh, people becoming more um, uh, in charge of risk management, those rapid antigens are, are important. Then the other thing I wanna highlight is to hire and train a public health nurse and create a strong workforce in the health department. So here we are, um, we have an offer out to a great public health nurse and I'm checking my email. I'm hoping that um, we're gonna get a yes soon, um, but we really need to look at what we have um, for our department. If you look at our page 174, you can see what we have in ex existing um, uh, uh, employees. So we have um, the health director who's, uh, 1.0 FTEs, um, the, F, the nurse who we don't have, and then we have a program 
assistant who is through ARPA funding right now, and a contact tracer through ARPA funding. So <clears throat> that's something that you know I always want to make sure and make a plug for. The public health nurses 0.8 FTEs. Love to see that increased at some point to a full-time position. I think it's a really important time right now in public health to make sure that we have a well-trained workforce and that we have ample um, employees to provide the services, like I said, expanding and contracting. That's what I have. I don't know if you want me to continue on or if you have some questions. Well, thank you. Um, Sean, were there any questions that came from Michelle or others that you've received in advance? No, th this uh, this isn't general government anymore. We're in the um, community services section and there were no questions sent in for this department. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Jen, first of all, thank you for everything you are doing. And I wanna make sure people remember that during COVID, you had over 200 volunteers from the community and our staff that were helping you. Uh, and I just really appreciated that, uh, your appreciation event that took place to thank those many volunteers. I hope they continue to be available to you. Um, if you had a full-time nurse, would you find a different pool of recruits? And is that is that, a, is that differentiation an important issue, not just for level of service, but for um, recruitment? Um, <clears throat> so th the way I'm gonna answer this, I hope I can answer your question is, a full-time nurse is gonna be able to do more outreach. So pop-up clinics um, go to the mobile you know, um, food market. So, um, and to the schools, for example, really going to be able to expand our services there to our vulnerable population. Still um, very much need um, our, um, oh, our COVID ambassadors. That's something I didn't mention. We rely on them as well for registration during the clinics. And our vaccinator volunteers and other volunteers are just, just so important, so valuable to us. Um, they sh show up promptly with a smile. They're skilled, um, provide really good service. Um, so that's something we hope to continue. I don't know if that answered your question. And, and Lynn, just to add to that, so we are using ARPA funds to make this a full-time position, um, the public health nurse a full-time position through the end of FY24. So if the candidate wants full-time, not all candidates want full-time, but if the candidate did want full-time, there are funds to keep make it full-time for the next two years. Thank you for that information, Sean. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just noticed that the, um, the number of childhood vaccines and children immunized has been declining over the years uh, since FY17. And I know some of that was obviously related to COVID, but it looks like it it may be a broader decline than that. I'm wondering if there's some issue with communication. Is it anti-vaxxing anti kind of stuff or um, what's going on there? So the childhood immunization, that was a program that we had here in the health department. We had a little or a small immunization clinic that we would work directly with ARPS, with the schools, and we would take um, folks that have arrived in Amherst had children they wanted to get into school and they had to comply with the immunization, the vaccine requirements. We could take them in within a day, um, get them vaccinated, get them into school. So I love that program. I tell people that it was one part vaccine and nine parts um, getting them oriented to the, the town. I love that type of communication um, and interaction. So we get the, the parents in, hey, this is where you can sign up for health insurance, bring them down to the Musanti Health Center. Hey, Center for New Americans, let's get you hooked in with that. So that's a program we don't have now. It's something that I've been speaking to the school about, and they feel it's something we'd like to bring back. So like to see that happen, but not sure the status of that. Thank you. 
see, I'm looking to see if there are any other hands. I don't see any at the moment. Um, so I'm not sure if there's anything else uh, looking around yet to see if there's any final questions or comments. Jen, thank you very much. That was uh, kind of brief, but extremely informative and extremely helpful. And I know that the uh, health department has been through a difficult period uh, with transitions and with uh, trying to get us through a real health crisis like we've never dealt with before. We really appreciate all the department has done and thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'll just echo really what Lynn was talking about. It's just, we have such support. Um, and I just appreciate everyone from DPH just, just on down. It's just been great teamwork and collaboration. Well, thank you. Sean? Yeah, so I was going to look at Haley and ask her if she has any time uh, constraints because I um, I guess Rob has a time constraint, so I was going to move inspections next, but only if Haley's okay with that. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay. Andy, I also want to note that we no longer have a quorum of the council in the room. I'll leave the meeting open on case that changes, but we really might need to adjourn the council. Okay, well, I'll leave that to you to let me know uh, what you decide to do in the meantime. Um, so I guess, so we'll turn it over. Lynn, are you, do you want to adjourn first or are you going to wait? I, I'm going to wait. It's okay. at least has been seeming to have some connectivity problems and that's where the difference is. Thing. Okay. Um, so Rob, uh, who's our building commissioners, will be, is going to talk about the inspections department next. Okay. And Rob, thank you for coming back. I'm so sorry that things got messed up, but appreciate you being here and let you start. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Andy, Sean, Haley, uh, for letting me go first. Appreciate it. Um, good morning. Uh, so just a little bit about inspection services uh, and our uh, very talented, dedicated 10 uh, full-time employees and two part-time inspectors. Uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, grown into quite an interesting department. Uh, you know, our core services of building electrical, plumbing and gas, uh, permitting programs and inspections. Uh, is, is where this department started uh, now 10 years ago when I came to work for Amherst, but uh, we do a lot more now. Uh, we handle all the uh, licensing and support for the Board of License Commissioners. Uh, we manage a rental registration program. Uh, now, uh, seven or eight years uh, since its adoption. Uh, we uh, oversee the environmental health programs, anything related to septic well, uh, food service, uh, common VIC, um, camp uh, licensing, all, fun, uh, all fall under the, the health programs. Uh, we're really uh, heavily involved with facilities and assisting uh, Jeremiah when we can uh, with capital projects. And we coordinate uh, weights and measures uh, with the city of Northampton's uh, staff that uh, actually conducts the inspections of our devices through the town. Um, so we are in the midst of a very busy time. Uh, there's uh, more large commercial projects under construction uh, at one time than we've seen in a really long time. Uh, you might be familiar with them. Uh, the Newman Center, uh, One You Drive South, uh, the, the Amherst College Lyceum, uh, Southeast Commons, the East Gables, uh, and 11 East Pleasant Street is just about to start construction in the next couple of weeks. Uh, 26 Spring Street. Uh, so all these are in various stages of construction. Um, and, uh, and as a reminder, we do uh, all the electrical permitting and inspections for the university. We do not do building inspections. We do not do um, plumbing inspections there, but we do all the electrical work. And as you know, there's uh, several very large projects going on there. Um, we are... Uh, uh, trying to catch up on a few things. So uh, we're still recovering from uh, some of the delays that occurred during COVID, particularly with our certificate of inspection program. That is our periodic inspection program of certain buildings, schools, educational buildings, assembly spaces, religious buildings. Uh, um, as you can imagine, for one reason or another, we weren't entering those buildings for a period of time. Uh, some of them weren't in operation at all anyway. Uh, 
so we're still uh, catching up on those. And those those pro inspections occur. Some of them occur annually. Some of them are on a two year cycle. Uh, so that's uh, a little bit of a backup for us at the moment. Um, we are working with the CRC uh, to um, who is uh, very dedicated to a review and possible uh, rewrite of the rental registration uh, regulations and uh, doing what we can to assist with that uh, effort. Um, let's see, we um, have some really good uh, news about uh, enhancement to the department over the past year. We uh, transitioned to a new permitting and inspection management program. Uh, this was, uh, you know, long awaited and uh, very much needed and has uh, been great so far and thank uh, uh, not only my staff, but IT uh, staff that was very uh, helpful in selecting the product and uh, building it and getting it uh, up and running. Uh, this has uh, allowed us to go uh, to online permitting uh, for the first time. Uh, there's uh, a nice uh, way of communicating with the applicants. Uh, now through this program that we've never been able to do before. Uh, literally an, an applicant can apply from their phone, you know, on the job site and uh, respond to questions or ask their own questions of us. And, uh, you know, so you can imagine with that use of technology, coordination efficiency has improved greatly uh, as, you know, most of the users and, and permit applicants um, have really appreciated uh, that new program. Uh, so that's that's about all I have uh, right now. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Andy, there were um, questions in the packet from last week. So if anybody wants to see the questions that Bob submitted with the written responses, they're in the packet. And I just wanted to quickly echo what Rob said about the, the new software they're using. That's one of the real success stories. A lot of times software vendors sell you a bill of goods and it doesn't quite work out the way you, you wanted it to. But I think we're getting every dollar out of that software that, that we invested, you know, plus some. Um, and just for the committee's uh, uh, benefit, I don't want this to go to Rob's head, but um, Rob's department brings in a lot of money for the town. I was, you know, person for person in terms of the number of people in the department, um, especially in the last few years with all the building projects that are going on. Um, you know, they were, they've been working really hard to, to get our revenues where they need to be, so. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Bob? Uh, yeah, I just were... wanted to uh, echo the um, what what Sean said. I think the, the uh, electronic permitting system is probably going to save the town a lot of money and save the department a lot of headache. And I think that's a, a very wise investment. And I thank Rob and, and the IT department to, for, for doing that. I also just wanted to say that, you know, my own personal experience is that um, Rob is very responsive to complaints <laughs> about buildings from neighbors. And I didn't complain, but one of my neighbors complained a year or so ago, and the response was very rapid. So I did want to commend um, Rob and, and his staff for, um, for being very responsive as well. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Yeah, I'd like um, Bob to highlight any questions and answers that uh, he thinks the committee might be most interested in. I'm, I have to admit, I didn't go back and find that packet. I could share it, Andy, if you want. I have it on my screen, if you want me just to share it real quickly. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So I won't read them all, but I'll, I'll leave it on the screen if anybody has any follow-up questions. Yeah, the, the, the first question was just a clarification. Of, there was a bit of a mismatch of a couple of charts. Um, and I, the second one referred to the permitting system, which I, we've, already, we've already talked about. Um, and the third was really just more of a, you know, kind of what, what's going on. I mean, we had a decline in permits for a while, and now obviously the things have taken picked up. So I just wanted to kind of get an understanding of the, the flow of work from, from fiscal year to fiscal year. Uh, then I have some follow-up questions. I just didn't want to be repetitive. Um, so when we take on something like 
the Newman Center or something on the Amherst campus, on the uh, Amherst College campus. They're paying the same fees that, I assume they're paying the same fees that somebody who is developing a property that's on the tax rolls in the downtown or someplace else. And so that's my first question, is that assumption correct? And then the second assumption is, shouldn't we be charging them more since they don't pay taxes on that building and taxes are also what support this service? Uh, yeah, so the first question is that's correct. The fee schedule is set without any differentiation between uh, ownership or location. So it's type of building uh, and the fees are set by either square footage or the cost of the alteration if it's an existing building. Um, I have not seen personally, and, and maybe Sean or others have an opinion on this, I've never seen a fee schedule that uh, applied differently to either nonprofits or tax exempt uh, institutions. In fact, if there are um, fees other than building permit fees, usually they're, they're less <laughs> for, those, for those types of uses. So I haven't seen any building uh, construction fees that would be higher uh, and honestly never considered that. So maybe others have an opinion on that. I, I would have, say I, I imagine that the nonprofit would the argument would be used, but then this should this is something that should be brought into our negotiations of our agreements with the with those higher ed institutions. It's okay. a good point. Uh, um, other questions from the committee. This. Because I know I think that there's a change ahead that I'm, but I don't think that we really have enough that we can form it now. And it may not be a 23 issue; it may be a more 24 issue. But that is, um, I know that we have a group of counselors who are working hard on trying to revisit the rental registration program and uh, that that may have budget implications both needing to address on the revenue side as well as expense side. Um, but I assume that you're working with the, um, along with the counselors who are addressing that issue to try and make sure that it goes in an orderly fashion. Um, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the the CRC has a very uh, aggressive, um, uh, complete schedule for the rest of the year, uh, working through a, a new potential regulation. Uh, and you also know that recently the council adopted a new fee schedule for the current program uh, that does um, produce new revenue. Um, so there's opportunities to uh, either take an incremental step over the next year. Uh, with enhancing the program or waiting for the uh, counselors uh, to finish up their work and decide what the what a new program could look like. And, you know, we're uh, excited and anxious for either and both situations uh, and, uh, you know, uh, attending the CRC meetings uh, and doing what we can to support that effort. I think I'm going to leave it and then uh, um, with one observation unless Paul has something to add to it and that is that if there are changes that need to be made to the 23 budget in cycle that we have a process to do that um, if it's not necessary and that's something that has to be just monitored and uh, we will do, deal with it in course and uh, Jennifer yeah, I guess <clears throat> just echoing Bob, and I know Michelle will, uh, you know, concur with me that we do, uh, Rob and his staff have been working very closely with the CRC as we're looking to revise the rental permitting bylaw. We really appreciated that. And um, John Thompson um, attended a large neighborhood meeting on Fearing Street last night, and he really has the, the trust and appreciation of the residents. So um, we really um, appreciate Rob's staff. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Rob and his staff. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. So anything else? Uh, 
looking for more. Is there any other questions? Don't see any hands uh, raised at this point. So um, Rob, again, thank you. Appreciate your uh, working with us. And I know you sounds like you have something else you need to get on to. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, I guess are we uh, on at this point for uh, Haley, is that next? Yep, we have two more, Haley for the senior center and then after that, Steve for the um, veterans. So we'll start with Haley. Okay. All right, well, um, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, the senior center, we work really hard to make sure that older adults have um, a place in the community and that they're, they're active, they're aging in place. Um, so I can talk about some of the recent accomplishments in the last year. Um, you know, we had a pretty seamless um, pivot to remote operations. We onboarded lots of Zoom programs. Um, we're able to keep critical supportive services at the senior center. Um, reducing social isolation and maintaining health um, of seniors. We did to-go meals, uh, mask deliveries. We booked vaccine um, appointments for seniors. Um, you know, lots of, again, online programming. Um, utilizing both Zoom and Amherst Media. Um, through a grant, we were able to create a technology loan library so individuals who didn't have a device could get one from the senior center and still participate in our programs and activities. We strengthened the diversity of the Council on Aging with four um, of the nine board members representing the BIPOC community. And we secured grant funding for caregiver, bereavement, and resilience groups. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and continue the, the Farmer's Market Token Program, which gives $5,000 worth of tokens to seniors in Amherst to use um, at the Farmer's Market. Um, some of the key challenges on uh, the long range objectives for the Senior Center um, are to secure a sustainable stream of revenue to support a transportation program for activities of daily living and medical rides. We're looking to identify uh, space for an exercise gym and coffee cafe, and both of those will strengthen resilience and reduce isolation in our older adults. Uh, we need to maintain fundraising capacity with the Friends of the Amher Senior Center. Uh, increase the capacity to loan equipment um, like technology, um, you know, iPads, computers, um, and also durable medical equipment. And we're also looking to increase BIPOC leadership um, through recruitment, outreach, and services at the Senior Center. Um, in the coming year, some of the objectives are going to be to obtain age-friendly and dementia-friendly statuses, and we're currently working with the PVPC and the Planning Department to accomplish that. We're going to perform a programming and services review um, so that we can understand how to better meet the needs of the BIPOC community. And we're going to establish, uh, or we're going to look to establish a dedicated space and fund exercise equipment. Um, and then we'll also be providing input to the planning department on sidewalks and how to make them safer for our older adults. And of course, uh, we're already in the process of reintegrating uh, more in-person activities at the Bang Center um, and scaling up um, as we kind of step um, out of the, the move to uh, remote participation. And that's um, what I had prepared to me. You know, I, I was working with Helen on getting this budget document together. Um, and the only other thing I want to emphasize is that the staff, uh, Mary Beth and Jen, who are no longer with us, um, and of course, Helen worked very hard to get vaccine appointments for seniors. You know, if anybody remembers what it was like to get those appointments in February, they would be posted at all hours of the day and night. And so the, the team had to work really hard to make sure that our older adults had appointments. And I can take any questions. And Andy, there were no, um, no questions were sent in for the senior center um, ahead of time, so. Okay, so uh, is there any members of the committee or the council who have uh, any questions? Bob? Yeah, I'm just wondering um, if you could elaborate on the issues with transportation for for seniors and, and whether that, you know, there's there's something that we need to be thinking about as the as the finance committee and, in town council. Sure. Um, so one of the things that we had been doing before COVID was offering medical rides or assistance with medical rides. You know, we have two minivans um, currently at the senior center. So we, 
that was a really well used program. You know, a lot of folks have difficulty getting to and from their doctor's appointments. Um, one of the needs that we do have is looking at something that's ADA compliant. And we're currently working with the PBTA to get one of their retired vans so that we'd be able to offer non ambulatory seniors a way to get to and from medical appointments Good because the, the minivans don't have a way to accommodate walkers or wheelchairs. And just adding to that, Haley, I think you're working with Doug Slaughter, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So for everyone who knows Doug Slaughter, he you knows the business manager for the regional schools, but he also, um, I think he's on the, the board or the president of the board for the PVTA. Um, and he kind of cued us in that, you know, they have a much more regular retirement schedule for their vans and that they sell them off and that that might be a, you know, there might be a, a good um, value to be found there. Um, and the one thing I'll add to that too is uh, we did allocate some ARPA funds for um, transportation, and I think some of it depends on getting this van, or mm -hmm. um, but maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit, Haley, on how those funds will be used. Uh, so the ARPA funds will be used to pay for drivers. So when we get the van, you know, we'll of course need somebody who can drive it, and um, that'll help us, you know, step away from having volunteers. While we do utilize volunteers in a number of ways at the senior center um, for rides, you want a little bit more consistency, and so having the ARPA funds to pay someone will will give us that. Yeah, I would, uh, Sean, I sort of a, what Haley just said uh, piqued my interest because I think that we're doing a lot of things right now with ARPA funds to support operations, which is really valued, but um, gets into the question of what's the long term plan. And yeah, yeah, no, no, I think some of the things like this, they're not meant to be permanent, they're meant to be responses to the pandemic. Um, and support people as they come out of the pandemic and get them back out there. Um, and then if the town does decide it does want to make a permanent, we have time to consider that and see if there's funds in the future. But um, pretty much all the things that we've described, except for the firefighters, none of them are meant to be permanent. On the other hand, we could build a real reliance of our senior community on services that they would want and expect to continue. So it's not- Yeah, I, again, this is these, this is a new, you're right, we'll have to monitor that as we go forward. You know, there's, we've had ways of doing this in the past without those funds, but um, again, we're trying to put a, a boost into it now as we come out of the pandemic to get people back out using the programs. Bernie? Yeah, um, somewhere between a half to a quarter to a half of the nursing home admissions are right, because people aren't having aren't able to manage the medications. Um, so I'm wondering what um, our, our senior services might be doing to work with elderly folks um, like me uh, and to help manage those medications and, and interface with, uh, with the doctors to prevent nursing home admissions. And if there's any other uh, uh, in any other efforts in that in that regard, I mean, it's horribly expensive to have and painful to have something go into a nursing home. Um, it's much cheaper to keep them in the in the town. So I'm wondering what, uh, what what's going on in that regard. Sure, um, and that's you know that's a really great point because many seniors would actually prefer to age in place, and they they don't want to go to facilities like nursing homes. Um, so one of the things that we're doing, you know, is again, scaling up programs and activities. And certainly we do have a focus on making sure seniors have educational workshops that they can attend. And, you know, thank you for bringing that up because that's an excellent thing that I, you know, I'm happy to reach out to doctor's offices or work with the health department or some of the nursing homes in the area. And we can bring in um, instructors who can assist with that. Um, we can certainly look at caregiver type grants um, that may be able to provide um, you know families with some support for helping elders manage their medications. Well one of, one of the things um, that we were able to accomplish one of the towns I worked in was to have our, our public health nurse have regular conversations with um, seniors mm -hmm. and then uh, interface with that with their permission with their doctors to help manage medications. So that's an active case management strategy. Are, are we doing anything like that? Not currently, um, but it has been fantastic to work with the health department. You know, they've they've been really great neighbors and we're very fortunate to have them. Um, so certainly that's something I can talk to Jennifer about and see, you know, what we might be able to do to better serve the seniors. So thank you. Lynn? 
A um, couple of questions. Um, first of all, I let me. This is more a statement. Um, the Amherst Survival Center learned the same thing about drivers. It's better mm -hmm. to have consistent drivers than volunteer drivers, um, and so I think that's a good move. However, I do hope we can figure out in future budgets uh, beyond DARPA how to continue a service like that. My question really is: Are you collaborating with Amherst neighbors? which is really focusing on seniors and trying to increase, if you will, the volunteer nature. And then I have another question, but why don't we sure. stop with that one? Okay. Uh, yes, I've met with Linda Terry a number of times um, you know, since I started here. And I think it's, you know, again, they're a really pivotal organization. Uh, they started from grassroots and they've become um, a really important lifeline in the community. They're able to assist seniors who currently need transportation and they offer opportunities for people to get together with social programs. Um, so there's more collaboration to come. They did uh, co-sponsor a workshop on hearing loss at the senior center. We had invited the audiologists at UMass to talk about what is hearing loss, how to adapt and navigate and different types of hearing aids. Um, so that's just one program that we've collaborated on right now. And there's certainly more to come. And then the other thing is I, I applaud the Senior Center on trying to do as much as you could through Zoom mm -hmm. um, and you know other electronic means, remote means uh, during COVID. I actually encourage that you continue at least some of that in a mixed mode uh, because of the isolation uh, that seniors feel. And maybe they don't have the time or the inclination to physically come and join you, or maybe they're afraid of ongoing COVID. So um, that's just an observation and a question about your plans to kind of continue to provide both virtual and in person. Mm -hmm. Uh, great question. So yes, we do still offer Zoom programs. We have several Zoom exercise classes. We have a cosmology group that meets once a week that's on Zoom. Um, you know, I in talking with the community, there are folks who miss coming on site and getting together with their friends. You know, at the open house, people talked about, I haven't seen this person in years and how wonderful it was to catch up with them. But not everyone feels that way. And I, you know, I want to be sensitive to those needs as well. So whenever we can offer, you know, a hybrid option or doing a special Zoom program, we're, you know, we'll certainly do that. Thank you. And thanks for everything you're doing. Yeah, Kathy, um, I know you have a time constraint because of an MSBA meeting. So I was going to. No, actually, I went and came back and you might see I'm I'm so I've been so quiet. You didn't know I was going, but I'm back. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> it would. <laughs> You can, Michelle can go up first. She had her hand okay. up. Okay, Michelle. <laughs> I noticed, Kathy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, um, Haley, I want to really thank you for your leadership. Um, I feel like the seniors are often, you know, sort of unseen, and I uh, just really appreciate you being a voice and leadership in that uh, department. And I had a question about Cress and seniors and how, um, if you see any possibilities for Cress to be supportive or helpful to the seniors in our community. Okay, great question. Um, and before I say anything, um, I think it really takes a village. You know, I, I can do what I do because I have a great staff, I have great volunteers, I have great support from the town. Um, so that really, without any of that, I couldn't do what I do um, and Cress, plays a part of that. Um, so coming up in July and August, we're actually gonna have two programs with Cress, a meet and greet, and then um, a logo contest because they're they're looking for a new logo and we're gonna have seniors vote on what that is. So um, we, we're already collaborating and I see Cress as really being another way to perform you know, in just one sense, um, like wellness checks, you know, I might be able to say to a CRESS responder, you know, hey, I haven't seen this person and they're usually here every week for this program, you know, can you go and follow up with them? Or, you know, and, and another example might be somebody is experiencing dementia and they're, they're not quite themselves. And they're, you know, sometimes we'll have cases where the person thinks they can still drive and they can't. And the family member has to kind of tell them that and that doesn't always go over very well a crest responder might be able to mediate that situation and help diffuse it and um, you know and keep the person at their house and not make it so that they need to be removed to another location 
a question to answer. Uh, can, I, can I just jump in on that for a second, yes. Andy? So, um, yeah, just credit to Haley who reached out to Earl when he first started, and she and Earl have created become um, regular companions and meet regularly, <laughs> usually for lunch, um, and um, but really formed a really strong team um, at the at the Bank Center. So that's a really good relationship building being built by Haley and Earl. they're all at the bank center. Uh, Kathy? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, you know, I could also just uh, send this by email to Haley, but the, what, Bernie, what Bernie brought up about medications, there've been a few um, I, very innovative healthcare programs that use public health nurses or aides, but whoever was in the person's home with their permission, took an <laughs> iPad and took pictures of all the medications mm -hmm. in the cabinet, because one of the things that happens is people don't throw out their old meds. And so not only is there confusion, but it took a picture with their permission to share it with the doctor. And mm -hmm. um, the uh, in New York, they, when they this was more connected with the primary care physicians, they were asking the doctors to guess how many meds the person was on, and they were never right. Um, mm -hmm. literally never right. And it was always on, they thought fewer. So trying to think of this multiple who's in the home um, and the um, opportunities for someone who's trusted, I think is, is really important. Um, and it's clearly not everybody, but it's, it's you can kind of get a sense. Um, in the rural South, this was huge. People were bringing in shoe, box, shoe boxes with medications um, <laughs> to yeah. take a look at them. Yeah. So it's it just I want to underscore that because it it leads to dementia and psych mental issues that end up being a hospital or a nursing home issue. Absolutely. Um, you know, so the the police department does a drug take back day uh, every um, every. April and October. And in Hampshire County, we had a ton, a literal ton of medications dropped off at the various police departments. So th those are, you know, like you're saying, it's very important to clean out those cabinets. Yeah. You, we no longer have a quorum of the council. So I'm going to adjourn the council portion of this meeting, not the whole meeting, just the council portion. Okay. Matt? Thanks, Andy. Actually, not a question, just a quick comment. Just want to thank Haley for all the work that you do with um, the seniors and uh, and especially the flexibility that you've had and creativity that you've had um, through the pandemic. We I was just looking, the Cultural Council did have, uh, we funded a the hip hop dance for seniors, mm -hmm. which I know was over Zoom and kind of a mixed format thing. And I and I just think, um, you know, being creative and, and collaborative and, and Find ways to reach folks uh, who who may not want to gather in person right now um, is is super important. So just appreciate what you do. Thank you. Yeah, I guess. I'll bring, are there any exceptional challenges that um, you're having to think about as you try and move back to a more traditional Meals on Wheels program? Uh, challenges with programming in general or food specific? Recruitment also. Um, I think that, you know, the challenge is really just knowing what tomorrow is going to bring. You know, sometimes you you know, you make a plan and you think I'm going to do this program and then you, you find out, oh, cases are climbing and it, you know, wouldn't be a good idea to do it this particular way. Um, the listening sessions for the Agent Dementia Friendly Project are a great example. We wanted to do some of those in person and now we're kind of thinking we might do more virtual just because of the trends in COVID cases. So I, I would say, you know, a, that's a challenge. You know, I'm thinking ahead, the holidays are coming up and how are we gonna get seniors together? How are we gonna socialize in safe ways when there's a reasonable expectation that, you know, COVID cases will go up at that time. You know, we, typically we see a lot of the flu anyway um, during the winter. So does that, does that answer your question, Andy? Yeah, no, I was just thinking about it because uh, I had friends who had been volunteers in the old program and uh, what they always said was is that it was a program that not only got meals to people but also got contact isolated so oh the the umass meals on wheels yeah, yeah that was um so unfortunately that was suspended during covid but i have um, reached out to 
the executive director of the auxiliary services for UMass, and I'm hopeful that we can, um, you know, relaunch that program at some point this year. Because like you're saying, it, Meals on Wheels is really important because sometimes that's the only contact a person is going to have all day. That individual is you know, homebound, they're not able to get out and just having that volunteer go and talk to them for five minutes can, be, can light up their whole day. Um, and not only that, but it provides meals. And my understanding of the UMass program was that it was an entree and a lunch. So people got two meals through that program at a very reasonable rate. Um, so certainly, Food is a big passion area of mine. And I, you know, like I said, I'm going to try to relaunch that program with the support of UMass. Okay, thank you. Anything else on senior uh, services? You know, just to keep your eye out, you know, we have, like I said, a lot of activities, a lot of programs coming up, collaborations with, um, you know, with APD, with CRESS and the recreation department. You know, we, we really want to get out there and get involved in the community and just help our older adults, you know, there's a lot of older adults, you know, like I've said before, 5,200 people are over the age of 60 in town. So we want to make sure that they, they know that they're welcome and they have a place. Okay. Um, anything else? Uh, I'm looking to see if there are any hands that go up because I think the only other thing that I would say is that during the hearing, we heard several comments uh, and uh, they, regarding the need for space in the senior center and uh, the programming that goes with it and uh, to think, be thinking about the whole need for um, a new lo new location or new space plan and uh, just want to assure you and everybody that it was a hearing but we heard yeah, yeah. I, I think um, there's been a lot of support for in the community for this and I'm, I'm looking forward to you know seeing what the next steps are you know of working with the town manager's office and the finance department, um, you know we'll certainly do our you know our work to get on the the joint capital plan and you know. Um, this is my first go around for any of these cycles so I i'm really happy to have the guidance and uh, and support of town hall for that. Um, you know, because like you said, there are some challenges that we're experiencing, but um, the best way forward is, is coming together as a community and as a town and, and getting a solid plan together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if there's something else, I guess, uh, Sean, we're uh, now ready for uh, Steve Connor. Yep. Yes. Yeah, uh, so the last department um, to go is Steve Connor for the veterans. Hi, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just made sure my I was a little late getting on because my Zoom is working sometimes and not others, but today it's working. So uh, I'm not a great tech person. So, <laughs> um, so um, it's been a challenging year, um, and uh, I foresee the coming year also being challenges. And, and the reason I say challenging is because uh, very much the issues that Haley is speaking about are happening in my world because so many of my veterans are aging. Um, if you look at our numbers, it's, it's very deceiving. Um, we run a program of benefits under chapter 115 law that for indigent veterans, um, senior veterans who are low income, um, those numbers are down. They're down statewide because of COVID, we believe. Uh, some of it's, though, also the aging of uh, large majorities of, of veterans. And now we have Vietnam veterans going into that group. Um, but the need of veterans in the community have gone way up. So my senior veterans... Um, their needs have gone up immensely. And I've had a heck of a winter and spring uh, with some of, um, some of the veterans in Amherst um, because of their needs. And as I do that, uh, it's coordinating services with my office, with who el whoever else can help. And that's many times the VA, but not always. And so, um, 
it's staying on top of things. And some of the other, a lot of the cases that I'll have won't be people that I'm giving them benefits under the state program because income, they're doing fine. They may be 100% service connected veterans, but the 100% service connected veteran doesn't get money from me, but they need a whole lot of services from me. And whether it's they, they need home modifications done and that's a whole process and, and it's paperwork and bureaucracy that they don't understand. Um, you know, there is some tax issues that we help with, but that doesn't seem to be a big deal either. The other thing that's going on is the people that um, through the VASH program, and for those that have never heard of it, it's called the VA Supportive Housing. It's a program to end veterans homelessness. And it's been around for about 14 years, um, 13, 14 years. And it's been very successful. It's taken formerly homeless veterans out of shelters and out of those GPD beds and put them into permanent housing. Well, there's hundreds and hundreds of placements in our area. And I've helped place many of those people. Um, and many do live in Amherst. What has happened is, is after a while, once they seem to be stable, they are dropped from case management. The um, VA says they're doing fine. We can now concentrate on more people and they get new vouchers and these other people are left to be stable. Well, we discovered this year that there's a problem with that system in the sense that as these veterans that were formerly homeless age, there's challenges and they don't have a case manager. I know about them because they may be on my benefits. They're still low income. That's why they have the subsidy. Um, it's a section eight subsidy. I had a veteran that I was working with trying to get him a service dog. I got that. And then I didn't hear from for a couple of weeks. And I thought that was kind of weird. And I got a call from Cooley Dickinson Hospital that the veteran had um, had a stroke and that he was there. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's really great that the hospital told me. I think the hospital was trying to tell the VA hospital that information because what ended up happening is he ended up in a hospital. Then he went to rehab in Ludlow. He was out of his apartment for five to six weeks and nobody knew it except certain people and nobody connected the dots. The veteran then um, was brought home, released from rehab and not even to his house, but to his girlfriend's house. And I get a call four days later that that's happened. I'm like, oh, okay, well, all right. Um, and services, the person who called me said, well, yeah, I'm the one who goes in and does occupational therapy. I just went there. I think somebody has to go um, work with him because he hasn't eaten in four days and he doesn't have his insulin. And I'm like, what? His girlfriend couldn't get it because she's in a wheelchair and his apartment isn't accessible. He couldn't get it because he was still confused and could barely walk. And they released him. And it was crazy. I went and found old medicines, found all kinds of stuff. But he did go four days without that. So I ended up having a meeting with the VA in, in Leeds about this very thing. Since that happened, they have created a new position. They've hired on a new social worker who's only there now to check on all the uh, VASH people that have been released from case management that might need support again. Um, but so it, it's, it's, it's this whole crazy system of meeting the needs of my veterans. Um, and now they talk about potentially closing the VA up here, which now has freaked out a whole lot of my people district wide. I'm, Steve, can you explain what the impact would be if the hospital was closed on the region? I mean, aside from obviously the hospital being closed, but what would happen um, to all the, the veterans that are being serviced by that hospital? It, it's what, what they're, 
what would happen is, is all the veterans that are relying, especially in the rural communities, are relying on that hospital to be there to meet the need. They're talking about closing it and building a bigger facility into Springfield. Now, take just the gentleman that I was just mentioning. He's formerly homeless. He doesn't have a vehicle. So if he has to go to an appointment at the VA, currently he can get on one of the buses and it goes all the way up to the VA. If they move it to Springfield, he either has to take a Peter Pan bus and then a smaller bus to get to wherever they're going to build this place. Or he can take the PVTA and it'll take him three and a half hours each way just to get to an appointment. So that's not going to work. I have met with Congressman McGovern about this and we're really fighting it. We came up with a plan of action. He's had a listening session. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's going to be a, a really hard hit for my senior veterans and my disabled veterans. So uh, we're fighting it. It's nine to 10 years into the future. One of the things that the, when they made these recommendations to this air commission, um, what they didn't, what they had used as data was that $125 million in repairs and updates need to happen up there. And that was a report that they'd done in 2013. Well, what they didn't say in this finding is that they've already spent $100 million. I don't know if anybody here ever goes up to the VA, but it's been under construction for years. All the underground work has been done. All but two buildings have been redone. Uh, it, they've just done, and the biggest building, half of it has been gutted and they're redoing it. And they're going to keep going for the next several years. So we're really trying to convince the administration and Congress that they can't close this hospital. It, as is, they're already reducing the amount of um, services they provide. Um, so veterans are going to have to travel. But even more importantly, um, you know, if, if they close it completely, my, my veterans just aren't going to have access. And they're going to go more and more into the community. And I will say again, and I'm running, uh, I'm working with a group called the Just Ask Campaign. Medical facilities do not know how to work with veterans, especially disabled veterans. Um, if they have PTSD or traumatic brain injury or other issues. And so we're trying to address that as well. So as they shrink the VA and throw my veterans into the community, the community is not ready for them and don't necessarily understand how to deal with their issues. And so uh, it's, it's a frustrating um, experience, but I guess we're fighting it and see what we can do. So just adding to what Steve said, just for new people to the committee. So the VA section of the budget has sort of two primary expenses. It has the assessment we pay to the central Hampshire Veterans Service District, of which Stephen is the, uh, the lead and he has staff there and they do all the engagement and outreach. Um, and we're a member with several other communities. And then the benefits that um, Stephen administers and pays out to veterans um, is the other big chunk. And we get um, both of those figures we get from uh, Steve each year. So Andy, I guess if you wanna turn it over, there were no questions sent in um, ahead of time for the, okay. for the veterans group. So if there's any questions now. Yeah. We're gonna see if there are any hands that don't have these questions. Oh, the one thing I did want to say while people are thinking about it, just um, we are continuing to get our 75% reimbursement and that's, we've not had any issues with that. Um, so we are getting our state money back, but as we have um, lost some of that caseload, our application for um, disability with the VA system for some of our veterans has gone up and uh, so has the money that comes in. So I've got a record that last year, um, money that's coming from the VA to veterans or their spouses through DIC or through their pension program for aid and attendance if they need, you know, people coming into the home, keeping in there. Uh, we brought last year, it was $211,000. Um, 
per month that is coming into the VA, into the town of Amherst for those veterans. So that's, uh, that number's risen since I started here. So, um, so one level is going down, the other one's going up. But. Kathy? Uh, thank you very much, Steve. I'm gonna ask a question that we asked of Haley. Um, we have a new program called CRESS and one of, among the many populations that we wanted it to be able to serve for people with um, post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, you know, acute mental issues that aren't well dealt with. So um, I don't know to what extent you, Haley, and then eventually Earl have shared lists of the kinds of people we're talking about. You know, so um, some of the vets are probably homebound, you know, when we talked about homebound, but just, you know, thinking that the, per the, the human being might fit in multiple categories. Um, and that they're they're both this, that, and another thing. And I know, you know, if, if you don't get veterans benefits, if vet, the VA hospitals and around, the Medicare program is not as robust as what VA does to wrap around, including drugs. Um, but I just, so this is just a, to the extent some of this can be coordinated. So we have, um, at I think of it kind of as an at-risk list list mm -hmm. that, someone's paying attention to. So whichever uh, resource. Um, so it's a comment rather than a, have you done this? I mean, we, the program's right. not even up and running yet, so you wouldn't have been able to do it. Right. So um, as I've been running around because Memorial Day is coming up and I'm everywhere in the district and trying to do all these things, I did run into town hall and I saw Earl. Um, I worked with Earl previously uh, in our homeless program. Um, so he and I had worked on it. And so I said, after Memorial Day, I would love to sit down and go through, you know, what's going on with my veterans. And of course, I also get some of the veterans going to Craig's place. And so, um, and those are usually with significant um, mental health issues. So we are going to, I'm hoping to meet, and I'd love to sit and meet with Haley as well, because one of the things through the years is I've been working more and more with Helen on some of the same people. She refers them to me. I, you know, we, we've coordinated pretty well. So um, yeah, if I can get through Memorial Day, uh, I would love to have some more connections with people, but it's just exhausting right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Steve, would you be able to give us a little more of a sense of the profile of the vets in Amherst based on age, race, and their vets of which wars? So um, there are still, you know, one of the one of the hard things is to get a handle on all the veterans because so like the VFW is closing, they had younger vets but now that that building is closed and the post isn't very active they're dispersing and so it's hard to keep track of them the older veterans at the american legion aren't coming in as much so trying to keep tabs on people i went it took us i worked with the legion we had one gentleman who was one of their officers he had some health issues i worked with him in the last couple of years about it and i was trying to find him housing and then we didn't hear from him for five weeks. The Legion kept trying to find him. I was trying to find him. He wasn't answering his phone. Well, it ended up, he moved uh, back with his sister under the Cape, but it took us weeks to figure that out. Um, so just that, that's the struggle I have with any community is keeping tabs on them because they don't have a central place anymore like they used to, that they go to. Um, but I kind of look at, the veterans in Amherst, we have those that have basically went to war, came back, resided in Amherst and stay in Amherst. Those are the people who don't need my financial services so much, but need other supporting services, like getting them into um, the VA health, getting them disability pays, um, all of those kind of things and, and helping them plan their funerals. I've 
got a few of those this year. And, and so I, I have that. And then I have those veterans and a bunch of them are Vietnam veterans that have been homeless for decades. And now they're in, everybody knows most of them are African-American. They move into Amherst because they feel that that's a warm feeling for them because they, they see community there uh, in Amherst and in certain par um, parts of Amherst where they're not going to see that in Williamsburg or, you know, other places. So that's um, a good population in Amherst. They need both my financial assistance, but as they're aging, they need a lot of connecting to services. And also, um, as they get older, they keep forgetting things. So uh, I've been work trying to get my paperwork for some of my veterans. It's taken me five months to get one guy's paperwork done so that we get the 75% back on his money because he has a phone. I got him the uh, assurance phone. They used to call them the Obama phones. Well, that was great. It's free, but he can't work it. And I've been trying to teach him for five months how to work this phone. He just never going to get it. He's 83 years old. So I have to drive to go see him. He lives over at the village and I have to always go and see him. So some of my veterans, I actually have to go in person to connect with. Um, so it, it, there is an array like in every community, um, but I'm hoping. And I think one of my objectives is talking about um doing more outreach. I did start and it's on the town site. I have a new show um, about outreach and about conversations about veterans benefits and services. And I'm trying to get it. I'm going to talk with the folks at Amherst Media to get it on the regular television, but it is on the website. And I'm going to be doing those monthly and talking about the different issues. But every time I talk about what we do and what we can provide, um, because I know there's a need out there, but finding all those veterans or the surviving spouses of, of veterans is even more important because they don't even know I exist and that I can help them. Um, so hopefully that answered your question in a very roundabout way. Yeah. And just, it, it does. I mean, I, I think what we need to remember is veterans go beyond Vietnam. Um, oh they're yeah. Not, they're not just old Vietnam vets anymore. And unfortunately, we continue to not necessarily honor people in our service. But more importantly, Steve, there'll be at least five counselors on Sunday, on Monday. Yay. All right. That's great. That's great. And we actually, I think it's going to be a nice program because we have an old friend who just wrote, um, I haven't gotten through the whole thing, but he wrote a new book about a uh, Amherst college student who uh, left college to become an officer in the army to fight the civil war. And he's going to talk a little bit about that book, Mr. Romer. And uh, I think that's uh, inspiring for Amherst that he, he keeps bringing the, the history of the civil war and how the African-American uh, population in Amherst had a central role in all of it. And I, I also want to, commend the town. I love where the uh, Civil War tablets are. And I have some people who come over and say, I just wanted to go see the tablets. So that's a great thing that that's back up. You're muted, Andy. So there was noise in my background, so I shut it off for a minute. Um, is there any other uh, questions on veteran services. If not, uh, Steve, thank you. It's always good to see you. I look forward to Monday. And, Very good. Uh, and I think it'll be a good day and no rain. So, yeah. So far, so good. You've thank you, everyone, for too, listening. But, uh, you, you, you've got this one fixed, it looks like. So, thank yeah. you very much. I appreciate your being here. Thanks. Um, so where we are in the process, and I want to get to public comment too, uh, because I know there are a couple of members of the public here who may wish to make comment. Uh, 
we have three things that we want to accomplish now. Um, one is the public comment, of course. The other is, is the um, get back to whether there are any last overall budget questions that um, I know we have received some from one counselor who's not um, present today, but did send them in. And Sean was going to at least um, point us in the direction of what the questions were and what he could provide today. Um, so that that's two. And the third is that um, we are um, setting up the process because Tuesday is going to be the um, committee meeting where we're going to make the um, decisions uh, going to review the budget. And uh, what we wanted to do was identify um, issues that members of the committee want to discuss in more detail and um, that uh, will require particular focus. And I said that any, if any is uh, supported by two people um, on the committee that we will schedule time um, for the discussion of that section of the budget. Just remembering we are focusing on the town manager's FY23 budget during this discussion so that those are the items that those are the subject matters that we will be needing to consider and um, then um, it is a part of that if there is a motion that um, is consistent with the charter and um, state laws to um, what the council what might be recommended to the council for action on any particular section of the budget um, that would then flow from those discussions. Um, so I was trying to identify um, today any that we can I, that um, might arise, though there will be an opportunity on Tuesday next week to do that again. So those are the three things. So I'll start with public comment. And if there's any members of the uh, uh, public who are present who wish to be recognized to speak to the committee should raise their hand. Um, we ask that you limit it to th uh, three minutes, and um, but we very much want to hear from you. And I noticed that Tony is uh, Cunningham has uh, been brought into the room because she did raise her hand. And uh, Tony, un unmute your mic and uh welcome thank you tony cunningham owen drive i wanted to comment on the discussion earlier about surplus town property it would be great if the property disposition advisory group were formalized and their meetings made public on june 13th the elementary school building committee will select the site for the new elementary school having followed the process closely from day one I am convinced that Fort River is a far superior site for a school for almost 600 five to 10 year olds. This would leave Wildwood for other town uses. I would like to encourage the town, whether that's this body, JCPC, Jeremiah LaPlante or Rupert Roy Clark, to prioritize the improvements needed to the school building that will remain and get those improvements into the 10 year capital plan with the most urgent needs starting in FY24. Good planning will ensure there is no gap in occupancy between when the school moves out, hopefully in June 2026, and when other groups can move in. Wildwood is absolutely habitable. If it wasn't, my nine and 11 year olds wouldn't be spending six hours there every day. As you know, many community needs have been identified as priorities for residents, including more space for a senior center, a cultural center, a youth empowerment center, space for the performing arts and education collaborative, et cetera. I hope that the comments made by members of this body about dumping abandoned property on you and seeing property as a liability were not referring to the remaining school building. As an 82,000 square foot town building with parking is an incredible asset that cannot be replicated. To purchase property and build any of these centers from scratch would cost many, many times more than the cost of the repairs needed to the school building. In the 10 year capital plan in the FY20 budget, Priority repairs to both Fort River and Wildwood were included. Once the site for the new school is selected on June 13th, the highest priority improvements to the remaining building need to be added back to the capital plan. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Anything else, anybody else who wishes to be recognized? Um, thank you. I appreciate the uh, public comment. And uh, Sean, you had uh, received some um, questions from Mandy Haneke. Sure. Um, so I will go through these, Paul. Feel free to jump in, or Sonia, feel free to jump in if you want to add anything. Um, so the first question was, what hard decisions did you make in funding various departments in order to present us a general government budget within council guidelines? Um, so from my perspective, and others may have different perspective, I think um, it's that we weren't able to invest in areas that a lot of you have heard about throughout these meetings. Um, we've heard about a number of departments that have been stretched during the pandemic or have taken on more uh, responsibilities um, that, you know, if we, if, you know, if we had no restriction on funds, we would probably look to add to those departments. Um, some of the ones you've heard about are facilities. Um, facilities, obviously, there, there's lots of needs there. Um, our IT department you heard from in terms of supporting meetings and all, all that goes along with that. We heard from our recreation department. Um, and I think the last one we've also heard about again is public works and the, uh, you know, the, the issues they've had attracting people and retaining people. So, so I think there's a number and there's, you know, every other department has needs as well, but I think those are some of the ones that we heard through these processes that if there was no limit to funds, um, you know, we would look to look to do something more. Paul, Sonia, any, you want to add in? No, good. Okay. Um, what isn't funded? How much would it take to fund them? Um, so just the things that I just described, I mean, it depends what we did, um, but you know, it'd be, we'd be looking at probably at least $300,000 more for just the government, the general government budget um, or the, the municipal budget, not the schools um, in order to, to do, you know, add positions and, and fund different things. Um, and again, it, it'll all depend on what we did. And these questions are not all on one topic, so they may bounce around a little bit. Um, it was an email of, of several questions. Um, so the next question is senior services, library and recreation all have friends of groups. How much of the operating budget for each of these departments do the friends of groups provide? How did this reliance come about? Why are these departments forced to rely on fundraising but other departments are not? So we don't have super satisfying responses for that one. Um, you know, I've talked to Sonia, she's sort of the office historian for me um, in terms of how this, how things came about, you know, no real, you know, Sonia, unless you want to add anything, you know, there was nothing that stood out as noteworthy how these things came about, they just happen. Um, the, you know, one thing we stopped doing because it wasn't part of the manager's budget, but if um, people, like I'll give people a sense of it now in terms of how much funding is provided, um, these are not funds that the town receives. These are funds that um, belong to the friends of groups. So we don't have great, you know, we don't know exactly what they're buying. We don't know. Um, I'm sure the, the people who work in those departments have a better sense, but um, we don't have an accounting of that per se. Um, but we did get some of that information in the past. So I'll, the senior center is probably the one that we had the most information on because um, it used to be part of the budget book. And so I think the friends of group in FY18, just to give people a sense of magnitude, um, fundraised, I don't know if they spent this much, but they fundraised about $26,000. Um, so I don't know about recreation. I don't think we've tracked that or have that information available. And I'm not, um, I think the library budget, Sharon may report on that a little bit. Um, so again, not great, not a great response to that in terms of how it came about. Um, why that's the case, you know, the only thing I can think of is these are all, those three areas, library, recreation, senior services, they're all departments that provide programming and programming can be scaled up, it can be scaled down. It's one of those things that if, if there's a certain type of program people want um, that may not be within the existing operating budget, they could fundraise for it. And over time, you know, things change and, and scale up that way. Um, I think the departments that don't have friends of, friends of groups are the ones that sort of provide, you know, it's not a programming service to the public necessarily. The next question, so additional programs, departments obje or department objectives include several additional programs, the senior services area, um, an exercise gym and more programming, the recreation department, a youth empowerment center, 
the fire department mentioned the community paramedic initiative and the communication center mentioned a new lead dispatch position. How are priorities for additional programs determined across departments and how are these decisions the council should be making or advising the town manager on? Um, so the one I'll pull out is the youth empowerment center. So that's such a large decision that that would be, you know, a community decision, a council decision, a town manager decision. That would be a much broader conversation um, if that was, uh, if we move forward with creating something like that. The other ones in terms of an exercise gym, the paramedic, uh, community paramedic initiative, lead dispatch. If that's thing, if those are initiatives that can be added within operating budgets or, or incorporated within existing operating budgets, um, then that would fall under the town manager. Um, if it's something, you know, we the each budget gets, uh, the, the government budget gets some new funding each year. So if there are things that can't be handled within existing operating budgets, but maybe uh, the, uh, the process we have with departments is they're able to propose additions each year. So when we uh, review their budgets, they send in an addition form if they're going to propose any additions. All of those get added together and prioritized um, uh, by the town manager. And a lot of that prioritization is, uh, you know, it's compared to what new funding we have available. So the first thing we have to do is from the new funding we have available, take off contractual steps and colas and things like that. Um, and a lot of times that takes up a big portion of our new funding. So there's not a ton usually left over for, for new things. Um, this year in particular, there was no money left over for new things because any money that was left over for new things, we put towards the CREST program um, and DEI. So this year in particular, we're very, there was there were no additions but that's how those things would happen if there were was a new program or a new initiative and new funding was needed it would be requested and then it'd be prioritized i'll stop there because i see alicia has her hand up alicia yeah thank you sean um i was just wondering if you could specify what leftover funds were applied to dei and crest that you're referring to so when you to take our two and a half percent, I can try to get the exact number, but when you take our two and a half percent increase to the um, to the municipal budget, we first roll everybody up, steps and colas. Um, anything that was left over within that two and a half percent increase was combined with the $300,000 that was added to the, op the municipal operating budget to fund the, the 10 new positions within the operating budget. And I think it may be, um, I think it's in the the introduction to the budget. So hold on, let me see if I can find that real quick. If I can't find it quickly, I'll email it back to the group after. Yeah, let, let me email it to the group after, but I, for some reason, the, the number 360,000 sticks out in my head is what we had to add to this year's budget for Cress. Um, we know that we went $300,000 above the regular two and a half for Cress. So the, the balance would be um, the difference of the, the 60,000 or so that would have come out of the, the two and a half percent, which is our regular increase. I think, uh, I think, it, was, I think it was 371, 520, if I'm looking at the right thing. Okay, so. but we can send the, I'll, I'll send the exact numbers um, after. Thank you. Uh, so, Bernie. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I just thought I had announced the uh, formation of a Friends of the Finance Department um, group, so we can make sure that uh, uh, <clears throat> everybody in, in the Finance Department has an ample supply of coffee and uh, uh, headache relief. So We've actually decided, Bernie, that next year we're going to sell the budget books. Um, <laughs> so. Be prepared. It's going to be a ten dollars fee for those. And uh, okay, as long as you're available through Amazon, we can get them. Um, uh, the question I, I I do have though, and and I it, it, it ex I'm sure it exists, and I just haven't found it or um, have ignored it. But it'd be very helpful to get an ARPA spending plan. Yep. So we know exactly where uh, the ARPA money is going, and uh, where um, you know we, we'll be looking in the future to replace ARPA money with taxation or some other some other forms because i think your three hundred thousand dollar figure uh sean with all due respect is a little low um i think we've gotten a substantial uh, my guess we've got a substantial boost from arpa and that we're going to have to make some um painful decisions um uh, going forward about uh, about this i appreciate all the work that's gone into this it's it's a it's a huge amount of work 
again, it's a real balancing act and lots of, lots of stuff has to, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of nights spent thinking about this, I'm sure. Um, but I would appreciate an ARPA spending, uh, spending plan and uh, um, we'll, we'll say thanks. Yeah, so um, I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. Um, so Bernie, this is page 269 of the, um, the budget document. So this gives the, the categories or the, the projects that ARPA funds have been allocated to. You can see it's a very wide, um, you know, pretty much every department one way or another, it has some connection to some ARPA funding. Um, affordable housing, homeless, homelessness were sort of the two big ones that um, Dave Z and his team are working on. Uh, the fire EMS staffing one, you can see there, the, many of these projects are over um, multiple years. So I don't want you to see the 875 for fire EMS staffing. I think that's one year, that's um, three or four years worth of funding. So the annual amount is lower. Um, the sixth grade transition, um, most of that is for, for one-time cost to um, support that transition to the middle school or, or one-time cost to the town, at least. Um, economic development, mental health. So again, we can, you know, at some point I'm sure Actually, I'll just do another plug. Each of these, there's project descriptions that are starting to go up. There's, um, I think there's over 10 of them now. They're up on the ARPA section of the webpage where you can dig into more these in more detail and see the more specifics about what's um, what's being funded and what the benchmarks are and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so many of these are up there. There's a few that are still being developed, so they're not up there yet. Um, but here, this is the plan again, and I'm sure in the future we'll, you know, sure. there'll be more questions on well, this. Yeah, some some of this is some of this is one and done. Um, and some right. of this is going to cause uh, some degree of ongoing spending, and that's the ongoing spending is a piece that I think um, we're going to have to focus on in future discussions. Right, and actually, you know, and as you look through it too, uh, uh, you know, I'll just point out, try to um, know areas where we actually hope it creates more funding for the town. You know, it's it's the the projects are intended to generate um, economic development or um, development of, 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 uh, of housing, uh -huh. things, things that will actually bring in more money to the town. Sure. Thank you. Um, okay, so let me keep, oh, Kathy has her hand up. Yeah, yeah I just wanna build on what Bernie asked, cause I know we have that page, but um, I think of it as some are one and done. Some, if we, that money's not there, we have a hole in an ongoing service you know, something that we're supporting. And some is potentially creating a new demand on the operating budget. And I would just like it sorted out because um, we didn't, we, we had a discussion on that list. We didn't have a long discussion on that list, but as we think through it, um, I, we, when we first saw the glimpse of FY 24, 25, 26, the tightness of that. And when I start to remove those phones, so it's a different way of thinking about it, Sean, um, from a, this is a one-time thing, that money goes away, that's fine. And I appreciate the economic stimulus. We don't, we might be spending money and getting more money because of that, but so I, I just would like to be able to think that way about it more. So I just wanted to build on Bernie's point, not to say that that list isn't a good starting point, but to be able to look forward. The other is um, on Mandy's list of uh, possible things that departments have mentioned that or others have mentioned that we might want to do. Um, several things came up in this budget cycle. One of the ones I found particularly intriguing was the EMS fire discussion of what uh, a a staff trained as more as paramedics and what they could do with homebound is really extension of the healthcare system. I have no idea what that might look like, but it's a waste of money the way we're doing it now. The, the care system, maybe not town money, to drive someone over to Cooley Dickinson, drive back and then drive them back again. Um, you know, if, if we could be do something to stabilize them. So I've, I found, and the comment was that unless they had to be staffed differently to be thinking about providing a different kind of service. And I wasn't sure how much was billable, you know, so it, you wouldn't want to add that without knowing you could bill for it. So I think some of this is not a, a quick discussion. It's, right. it's, a, it's a more exploration. And I have no idea whether mun there are municipal governments out there that are doing anything like this, that if we weren't thinking for next year or for two years from now, but it, goes with everything we just heard with the VA and, and uh, seniors, 
Um, so I was really struck by the waste, uh, particularly about, um, around mental health, um, repeat admissions, where our ambulance is driving back and forth and only getting partially paid for that amount of time. So it, sure. it's, a, it's a comment to flag the area that Mandy picked up. Mm. Yeah, it, this is actually kind of looking to next year and to ARPA. And that is that as we look at the number of buildings that are being built and are going to come online during this year, therefore bringing in more taxes, I think it would be important to um, begin even next year to take positions that are being funded by ARPA and start moving them onto the regular operating budget, like the police positions, et cetera. And the reason I'm saying this is right now, we have added 16 positions in this budget. That is a lot. And as we go into future years, trying to figure out how we're going to even be able to maintain those 16 positions is important. Now, I also have a, you know, slightly secret plan of what I would like to see us do with that additional ARPA money. And one of those ideas is to help use it toward our school to the extent that we can, so that we can help reduce the tax bill coming to people. But I, I just wanna start thinking about how we look at ARPA money now and how we look at ARPA money down the road and how we look at uh, how to wean the town of ARPA money. Because for operating, because it is a serious issue down the road. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think you're right, Lynn. I think if we see that revenues are doing better than, um, you know, better than forecasted, and we can have higher increases for operating budgets, um, we will certainly look to do that, try to bring those things into the operating budget sooner. Um, and if we free up our money, that's great. Um, I think that applies to both the town and the schools, right? Because we've heard about the schools and, you know, ESSER and, and what's going on there as well. So, so I think that's definitely on our radar of if, if we can, if, you know, state aid comes in better or other things come in better, we'll look to do that quicker. So. Yeah, Sean. Um, so for the ARPA funding, it, I, from what I could tell both the, the government and the treasury had certain categories for allocation. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering uh, with respect to localities, how closely our categories have to match up to sort of those broader categories. And if I, I assume that you've gone mm -hmm. through that exercise, I'm just, I'm curious about yeah. that. Yeah, you'll see that again on the, the project snapshots on the web page, what categories they coincide with. So um, smaller municipalities have a lot of flexibility with how they're used because one of the categories of ARPA is what they call revenue replacement. And they've given every community a $10 million allowance for revenue replacement. And since our allocation is only um, $12 million, essentially $10 million of it, we can use for anything that governments are allowed to spend money on. Um, that being said, the whole point of ARPA was economic stimulus and helping recover from the pandemic. And so, you know, when you look at our plan, that's really what we've tried to do with it. It's it, we've tried to you know, spend it on things that help stimulate the economy, um, deal with some of the major issues that the uh, pandemic showed us that we had, like mental health or public health, um, and tackle some of the longstanding issues that the town has identified, um, like like housing and the homelessness. Um, allocation. So those are sort of the three buckets we've tried to tackle. Um, and again, there's other things we could do, but you know, this list came out of listening to the community, working with department heads, working with stakeholders. Um, you know, we worked with the council, you know, we shared this with the council and got input from the council um, back in early, mid, mid 2021 or so. And then I think it was approved, not approved, but it was, we asked if there were objections in November and there were no objections. So. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that we've learned over the past months has been the effect of inflation on our costs and our construction costs, which is where it comes back to the elementary school. And uh, what extent we can use ARPA 
or uh, have other plans to address those issues because uh, some increases in costs we hope are temporary, but some increases in costs may not be so temporary. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things we weigh is impact. Um, so I, you know, I hear Lynn's point um, about using to reduce the, the school um, debt exclusion, especially because it's higher than what we expect it to be. Um, you know, we've looked at the numbers of, you know, every million you shave off of the debt exclusion, what impact that has. Um, again, I know it might be symbolic and, it, and, it, and it's important for the town to do everything we can, um, but the impact is very small because it's over 30 years, um, you know, it's of a large number, it's a small piece of it. So it's something we'll, we'll certainly look at. Um, and we do have about some, something north of $2 million that hasn't been allocated yet that we'll be looking to allocate this fall. Um, and I'm sure that will be one of the, part of the conversation. Okay, uh, Bernie? Yeah, one of the challenges here has been that the uh, <clears throat> the feds have pushed this money out the door because they want it used quickly, and everything's done on a post audit basis. And they're just slowly, as I'm seeing, they're like drips and drabs of audit standards are being and, and uh, are being released. So uh, um, I appreciate. I wanted to raise that because I appreciate how people have to dance around this to make sure that uh, we're not running afoul of a standard that doesn't quite exist yet. Now that's especially true of the CARES Act, um, and that may be some of what you're seeing as well. Um, the CARES Act, some of the audit, auditing standards are coming out now, um, you know, months after the, the funds have been spent, or months after the grant has ended. Um, so, so I'll just, keep I'll yeah, just to weigh in on that. You know, Sean has been very careful to check in with the administrators every time to say, "Is this an appropriate expenditure?" and has that in writing from folks for the most of the major expenditures. So I think we're in good shape. He's been very diligent about that. So I'll keep going through the question. So um, the next question, it appears you've proposed a budget that does not use our entire property tax levy capacity. There was about 165,000 of excess capacity. Um, what is the reason behind that? And how much would each additional sector get if we'd use the entire levy? Um, so there's a couple pieces to that. Um, what we've done is we kept, we've kept the excess levy the same as it was the prior year, um, or approximately the same as it was the prior year. Um, if we were to use all that now, um, two things. One, it would it would mean a larger than normal tax increase for this year. Um, and one thing we thought, given inflation and um, everything else going on, going larger than typical is probably not the best idea this year. Um, the second thing is that number isn't set until we do the recap. So that number is going to fluctuate a little bit. If we see a revenue that we don't think, you know, something between now and when the recap is done, um, whether it be our new growth number or other local receipt numbers that um, may not be coming in the way we thought they were coming in, that number is sort of the, the offset um, and would plug that. And then the question about um, how, so if we were to allocate that to the general government elementary schools only and the library, um, it'd be seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 more for each of those budgets and about $6,000 more for the library. That being said, I'm not sure that's the way we would have do it if we were. Um, we're using about $500,000 of reserves to support this year's budget um, and, and the capital plan. So I don't know if necessarily if, if we were to exhaust all of that, if it would actually go straight to departments or if it would go to reduce our dependency on using reserves this year. The next question is, um, is the 500K budget from the stabilization the planned use of reserves to boost capital spending and borrowing for the large projects? Um, and yes, it is. Uh, so that is, uh, if you look in the other financing sources section of the revenue, um, you'll see there's a use of reserves and that was, um, that's what that's for. Why are local receipts being budgeted for less than FY21 amounts, uh, which was a hard COVID year? Should we be higher than FY21? So if you look at FY21 closely, um, You'll, one thing will jump out to you, and this is actually the next question, and that's the fees line. You'll see there's about $237,000 worth of fees in FY21 actuals, but zero for the budget. And that's because those fees are impact fees for short-term rentals and for cannabis. And they're restricted in their use. They're not, they're not truly general fund revenues in the sense that we can use them to support the overall budget. Um, Sonia and I are looking at ways we may be able to set up a revolving fund or something separate to track those. Um, because it causes some issues. One, it causes this issue of comparing year to year where it's not gonna be budgeted. Um, 
because it's not unrestricted in that way. So we're thinking, looking at maybe set up a revolving fund of some sort. The other issue it causes is each year those funds fall to free cash, they're still restricted. Um, and so we, so we have to keep a running tally of our free cash um, or our reserves that are from that source so that when we do have a plan for how to spend those funds, um, you know, we know what the balance is and we make sure they're spent on the right thing, which is another argument for having a revolving fund. Um, so when you actually look at our reserve balance, it's a little bit inflated because it has those funds in it that aren't really general reserves. Um, the, a couple other reasons why FY21 um, may appear, uh, or why FY23 may be a little lower than FY21 is uh, we had a really high supplemental tax on FY21 that goes year to year. Um, there's some years where it's really high, some years where it's nothing or really, really low. Um, and the pandemic impacted that a little bit. So, so we don't assume really high supplemental taxes in the budget. And then cannabis tax, I think, is the other one that's down a little bit. We're projecting a little bit of a decrease for FY23 from FY21. That's because we're experiencing it now. FY22, um, we saw a big drop in our cannabis revenue. Um, and that may bounce back with some of the new dispensaries coming on. But um, our, our recent experience is that it dropped off. The second question, again, it's related fees. This line is zero for FY22 and FY23, which are the budget years, but it brought in over 200K in the prior years, which are actuals. Do we budget this line? And again, we, so we don't currently budget that line because it's restricted in its use. Um, and we're still developing a plan for how to use those impact fees. Again, they're restricted to only being used on the impacts of the dispensaries that pay them. Um, we're, one of the things we're trying to look into is like, how strict is that? And could they be used for broader um, broader social um, activities that might be able to help some of the things the town has uh, been talking about, whether it's CRESS, um, mental health services, other types of things. Um, so we're still trying to get, it's, get more information on whether it could be used for that. Um, next question, UMass strategic partnership is listed at zero. When is this new strategic partnership going to be executed? Why aren't we receiving funds in accordance with the expired one? has failing to execute a new one actually lost the town money because UMass isn't paying based on the old one. Um, so we're currently having those conversations. Um, the exact timing of when a new one will be executed is to be determined, but we are well into those discussions. Um, and you know, we'll have more information when there's something that we can report back. Um, in terms of whether, we're, uh, whether we have lost money or, or if we're receiving money based on the old one, it's sort of yes and no. So the town is actually getting more money than we used to under the old agreement. Um, the town is, uh, the, the two things that sort of swapped is that under the old agreement, the town used to get $120,000 of sort of general fund revenue. That has been replaced by $185,000 going directly to the schools. So the town general fund budget, sort of the, you know, the, the money that we have to, to allocate, that has gone down by 120,000. But in terms of the net money that comes to the town, it's actually gone up because that 185 now is going directly to the schools. And that's the, the new revenue for the school department um, starting a couple of years ago. Um, and then the ambulance funds, which is the other big piece of that, that continues to be paid based on the, the prior strategic agreement. So overall, I, again, I would say it's a net increase, um, but the money that you, know, you see here in the budget in terms of the local receipt section, it's dropped. Finance, why are collection rates for motor vehicle excise, parking tickets, and ambulance billing so low compared to property tax and water sewer collection rates? What can be done to increase those rates? Um, so property tax and water sewer collection rates are, they're always going to be you know, pretty strong because they're tied to the property um, and they're eventually paid uh, when those properties turn over. Um, and our, our uh, collector's office does a good job working with um, residents that maybe need a plan or need you know, uh, help get, uh, paying their bills. Um, Motor vehicle excise and parking, those are also eventually paid. Um, they may not be paid in the year that we you know, issue them, um, but they do get marked with the registry of motor vehicles. And when the individual goes to um, renew their registration or to renew their license, they have to address any of those par um, outstanding tickets or that are over, I don't know if it's six, I think it's six months old or something like that. Um, so, so those are eventually paid. It's just the timing, maybe a little bit of a lag. Um, the ambulance ones, I think, are probably the ones that actually, you know, we're not collecting um, to, to some extent. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I think, you know, we have a very, our population don't, they don't all stay here forever, right? They come and they go. And so it, it, they're not always here. Um, 
it's uh, there's not as much we don't have as much leverage with the ambulance bills as we do with the other ones where there's something we can you know we can attach it to that when you know they go to renew or they go to sell their property we collect it we don't have that same uh, ability with the ambulance billing we did uh, we used to do ambul ambulance billing in-house same issue low collection rates um, several years ago we decided to use a, a third-party biller to see if that would help it hasn't so much helped from what we can tell um, and we do use a collection agency for bills that get over a certain uh, certain amount outstanding um, which helps collect some of those really old bills that are a little more aggressive than uh, the town or or the, the third party biller. Um, and you know one of the things we are going to look into more just to see if we can parse it out from the numbers I talked a little bit about with Jen and um, I need to talk about with Jeff Olmstead. Um, and you heard about this during the fire EMS uh, presentation is that some of it is just um, Medicare or mass health. They don't pay the full ambulance bill. And so I asked Jen, you know is that part of the collection, the gap in our collection rates? is it just that? these billers aren't, aren't going to pay our full rate and therefore we're going to always whenever uh you know we're billing those um, providers we're never going to collect 100 percent of it because that's just not what they pay um and she thought that might be part of the issue so we're going to see if we can parse that out because that's a little bit different than if somebody's just never paying the bill if it's just there's a fixed amount they're willing to pay um and, and maybe have better information on that next time and then the rest of the questions are about the regional school. Um, and I've got some answers and some I've sent off and I might, I'll have to send them back to the um, committee. So the first question is, how much time salary expenses does the town spend to maintain regional school owned property? And so we don't have an exact um, number for this, but I think Guilford mentioned it is a significant portion of time um, by the tree and grounds department during the spring, summer and fall to um, prepare fields, um, you know, do, they do some of the mowing, they do a lot of the, the preparation for events, um, they do the seating, things like that. Um, so I'd say, you know, it is a significant portion of time and they also help manage the pool. I think I mentioned that last time, they do the, the chlorine um, management, they do the testing and if it needs additional chemicals, they add those. Um, and, there, and, and so for the labor and, uh, that is associated with those activities, the region does not pay the town for that labor. Um, they provide the supplies if there's any supplies needed. If it, again, if it's grass seed or fertilizer um, or, the, the, or the chemicals for the pool, they will buy those, um, but they don't pay for the labor. Um, what type of support from the public health department is given to uh, the Amherst uh, Regional Public Schools? Do we receive any funding from the region for these services? Um, so Jen Brown did answer this one early this morning. So no services at, or support at this time and then therefore no funding is going back and forth. She said during COVID, the contact tracer was more involved with them up to the end of the calendar year. And, and that contact tracer was funded by either CARES or, or um, vaccine reimbursements, um, but they have no direct interactions now. Um, and so I don't know, if she didn't talk about prior to COVID if there was you know a lot of exchange of services, but my recollection is there, there was not. And Lynn's got a question, Andy. Lynn? Yeah, I need to call the council back to order again because we have seven in the room and I need to check to see if Dorothy Pam can hear us and we can hear her. Yes, I can. I'm sorry I was at another meeting. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll keep almost done. What other expenses does the town incur in its own budget that would normally be funded in the regional schools operating or capital budget? And the examples given were paving, vehicle maintenance, certification, supplies for field repair, payroll for staff time, et cetera. Um, so my understanding, again, talking to Guilford, is that the region does pay for the materials for the paving, um, for paving or pothole filling. Um, they, the region does handle its own vehicle maintenance. I know that, and they handle their own certifications. And I believe they pay for inspections. Um, uh, I think the DPW may do some of those inspections, but they pay the, the inspection fee. Um, the region pays for the supplies, again, for the field uh, repair or maintenance, but the, the DPW provides the, the labor. And Kathy has a question. It's actually a comment um, on this last set of questions. I think it's pretty clear one of the things Mandy's trying to do is create an accounting system that says we're giving services that are worth money so that when we're negotiating what the assessment method is, um, people have a tool to use. So I think it's less about this budget, this FY23 right. budget, and it's more looking forward. So I think, I mean, that's, 
that's where that set is going. And I think it's a really good idea, you know, whether, um, you know, I had notes that Paul, we don't build back normally, but it's more to make the case that you're getting services from the town of Amherst, period, you know, and, right. and they're, they're of value to you. It's not just, um, so the other, the other point on some of the other questions, um, they were clearly a very close read on the revenue side. And when I used to actually teach public budgeting, <laughs> Uh, one of the things I said is you always try to be conservative on the revenue side and on the expenditure side because you don't want to be wrong. So you, you've got to build a, a margin. We can't come back later. And I think some of this is just prudent management of our budget. So I appreciate the questions. Um, finally, one more just general comment. Um, I think we need to be really careful with reserves and pulling anything out of reserves because I'm extremely worried about the price tag that we're going to show to, on the elementary school budget that we need to go out for uh, uh, debt exclusion. So protecting as much as we can. And Lynn has already spoken on ARPA money that is not yet allocated to the extent it fits the category, trying to bring down what we're going to have to ask for tax for tax things. So I, I want to protect those reserves. I mean, that's why we've been building them up, but particularly with the school coming down the pike, I think it's even more critical. So to the extent we have savings, I want to offset the draw on reserves would be the other way of saying this. I think it's a good idea to be doing that, to, to be building up our ability, because it's only, we will be out in this, the way things are, we're hoping that we will reach an agreement on a site that MSBA will agree with us that things will go. And it's, we're going to be, we're talking about spring of 2023 when we're going to have that number. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's not in the distant horizon, but in the very soon horizon. That's it. Yeah, and so Kathy's exactly right. I, I'm not the rest of the questions um, I've sent off to the region. Um, the one question that's just uh, sort of counterbalances the previous questions is, um, in exchange, what expenses do the regional schools pay for that would normally be funded from the town's operating budget? Um, my recollection is that's primarily use of space and the town using space for different events and activities, but I want the uh, Doug Slaughter and, and Rupert to verify and see if they can provide more information on that. Um, cause, cause they do charge for some use of space, but I, I don't believe it is all use of space. So they'll, when I get responses to these other questions, I'll send it to the committee. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. Are there any similar questions that people from the committee or the council have about general budget issues so because we'll move to the last item otherwise because I, I think uh, in, I've said this before so I don't really need to go into again but we really do need to get back to a revisit of the building plan for the major projects and um, how that has changed and um, get an explanation to newly elected councillors who haven't had that um, thorough explanation of how that um, whole analysis works and um, how we came to the plan to begin with. Uh, I think it's a good refresher course for current councillors, for, for councillors who are carry over and an important one for um, the ones who are serving for the first time this year and we need to get those figures updated so we need to get that on the horizon at at, at the reasonable point when this uh that makes sense um what i wanted to just conclude with then is uh, to take a few minutes to um sort of organize ourselves for the next steps as far as what issues that we need to anticipate for our next meeting and um, if there's an agreement on issues we'll automatically place them on the list again we can come back and add on the 31st but um, if there are things that you know that you want to have discussed in more detail 
for either be, you because you're considering making a motion regarding um, changes to the budget within what is permissible under the charter and state law or because you would like to have a further explanation made to the council in our report and you think that the discussion is that the discussion is important for that, that reason um, that we try and identify them um, soon and the one that I was going to just start with and I'll turn to Lynn is that um, I think we have to address the elementary school budget question um, that has been raised by the school committee, um, though it would take one other person to agree to have that placed on the uh, agenda for the 31st, uh, since I'm just one person. Uh, but I'll start with Lynn. Um, Andy, I fully agree that we have to discuss the elementary school. I would like to also, um, there's two other, one other place where we've had a request with regard to the FY23 um, budget, and that is reparations. And so I think we need to place that on the list as well. Thank you. Michelle? This is more of a procedural question. Um, you had said that we need two people to support something being discussed. Andy, was that is that in our rules somewhere or is that just a No, chair? we just said that we would do that as a matter of course that, uh, you know, it, it, it's not in the rules, but it was just that um, we wanted to try and have some sort of process to get forward. And if there weren't two people who thought it was worth spending the time on that, we would uh, note that. Uh, I, by the way, I might as well ask right now, since Lynn has, put, uh, has mentioned reparations, um, can I put you down for a second so that we can get past that? Of course you can. Okay, yeah. so that's, uh, that's on the list then. Uh, do you have others that, uh, other things that you've thought about before I turn it to Kathy? Well, I support you and Lynn on the, the school conversation, absolutely. Um, but that's all I have for right now. Okay, Kathy. Um, yeah, this is um, sort of thinking as I understand this, the short version of the report before the version that has all the sections in it is that what I'm thinking is, I think we need to have a paragraph or two. And I wrote way too much for you on the discussion we had with um, public safety, but we had a series of voices uh, asking to reduce the police budget specifically. So I think we need to include a pair. So if we are doing everything but the schools we're, we're saying yes to, I think we should do a paragraph or two on why we're endorsing what's been proposed to us. And I tried to pick up as much of a flavor of that conversation because um, I thought it was a really good with Earl's voice um, talking about moving a program in, developing a program. So I just think it would be good to just acknowledge that we had had that, but keep it short. So it's not so much sing signaling out. And just on reparations, I, I know Lynn, you wanted to put it on, but I, I think it's a more of a future issue, but um, I'll look forward to the discussion. Uh, okay, is, I agree on the public safety, by the way, so I'll make that a second uh, just to get it on there because I do think that there was a, we, we do need to pay attention to the public hearing. And um, it was one of the issues that was raised significantly during the public hearing. And uh, therefore it has, I think it has to come forward. Um, there was another issue that I think was raised during the public hearing that I was thinking about, but it really has to do more with the capital um, improvement plan and future capital planning in that senior center space. Um, I, we do need to acknowledge that we 
had comments about that, but um, I'm not sure that it's an operating budget question. And this really is, uh, we need to focus on the operating budget. Michelle? Just, I would like to respond to what Kathy just said about reparations um, and just really clarify what the requests are from the African Heritage Reparation Assembly for this body. So there are two requests. The first is that the town council will agree to have free cash moved in to the reparations fund as they did last year in part as part of this discussion. And then there's the discussion, the second request, which is for permanently earmarking cannabis tax revenue for the future, FY24 and on. So I, I also want to remind folks that we were charged with identifying a, a, a funding stream and our charge is completed in June, 2023. So we're, that's what we're trying to do. Um, so the, the conversation that, we're, that we'd like to have and that we'd like for the finance committee to have is in two parts. The first being moving free cash, the second being uh, the cannabis tax revenue. Thank you. I think that the uh, complication in uh, Sean or Paul can, uh, or Sonia can add to this and explain it too. The transfer of money uh, to stabilization funds is not ever a part of the operating budget that's being proposed for the next year because it's really funded from the prior, the current year, it, um, what happens at the end of the accounting process for the present year. And since there's no um, place in the budget that says um, transfer any funds to um, stabilization funds, it's not included in the budget and um, since our responsibility is to say what we're recommending to the council that it can do and should do in relation to the budget, which is either to accept the budget or to propose a reduction, but except for the one piece, which is the elementary schools, if requested by the school committee, we can't add. Um, it makes it hard to. Um, say that that's really a FY23 budget issue. Sean, uh, do you think I stated that right or? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, th I guess I'd wanna hear from Michelle if she means the same as last year, meaning the same timing as last year, which again is when we do the, the free cash transfer, transfer, or if she means as part of this discussion, if she means now. Uh... Yeah, thanks, Sean. So. I recognize what you're saying, Andy, and I understand the way the process works, and I'm not requesting um, that Paul or Sean or that any of us make a motion to change the budget with respect to reparations. What I'm asking for is for this body to have the conversation now and make a recommendation so the town council can, as they did last year, approve moving money in the fall into the reparation fund. Um, I don't want to push that conversation off. Um, if you feel like it's uh, not part of sort of the box that we're working in right now, I'm okay with that. I just want a commitment from you and from the committee that we'll have that conversation along with the second request about the cannabis tax revenue um, so that it can get back to the town council to vote on. So that that's that's the, I hope that makes sense and answers your question, Sean and, and Andy. Yeah. No, it does. Yeah, um, Sean, uh, last year, we were doing something at this time of the year because the action that was taken at this time of the year doesn't have to be repeated, which was to create the fund. Yeah, but we didn't fund, we didn't fund it until the fall. But so we, we didn't could... fund it until right. the fall. So the recommendation that was made to the finance committee and then through the finance committee to the council last year came up in the 
in the fall after free cash was certified. Yeah, I, I mean, I think my recommendation is to, as, as Michelle said, have it on an agenda. Um, there's going to be other things we need to meet about in June. I already know a few that are sort of outside the budget process, but we'll need to go to finance committee. Um, one is the centennial funding um, that we've alerted you to. So we're going to have meetings in June. And I think having this be separate from the budget process because it's not in the budget, but having it on those agendas, I think accomplishes everybody's um, goals. Sonia, before I get to Kathy, I just wanted to remind everybody that until the books are closed, and that usually happens like August, September time, we won't even really have the final number for um, what came in for, for uh, cannabis revenue taxes until then. So we normally don't have any conversations about any transfers from free cash until it's certified. And then we have all those numbers. So we'll know whether we have 150 or 175 that's getting transferred. So just want to remind everybody, we won't have those numbers. Plus, uh, or certification. Yeah, and you had reported to us at the time that you discussed the third quarter budget report for the current year uh, that uh, we have certain concerns about what is going to happen within the fourth quarter and the year end uh, because of all of the inflation that we're now facing. Right. So, Kathy? Uh, I, I think I'm going to be echoing what's being said, but I just checked because I I want to check my memory. We had this discussion after we put the budget to bed last time. We had it in June. Um, it, it's on the June, it, because it got referred from the council on June 4th was on the finance committee's agenda, the AHRA proposal. So we were, we were first getting the budget done and then we were having this discussion. So I, I'm not saying not to have the discussion and not to schedule it, but we, it was separate because it actually, the referral came in and we we had those two very long meetings because um, we had a whole meeting around Crest too. So I was just looking at when it was on our agenda last time and we'd done the budget piece first um, before we came and looked at what I, what I meant about future. It's because it's an allocation of uncertain amounts of money when we're sitting here talking about it. So it was, in a slightly different time period, but very close to first doing the budget. Yep. Okay, Lynn? Yeah, I wanna be very clear. My reason for requesting it is because it was requested of us. So in my mind, it fits into the same category uh, as the other two items. They, they're outstanding questions. They were advanced to us. We can have the discussion. We can either make a decision or defer a decision, but we at least need to have the discussion. That's my only basis for bringing forward both, well, for bringing forward reparations. Thank you. So I think that the, 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 the difference is getting a narrower because it's not a question of discussing it. It's a question of whether to discuss it on May 31st or um, put it into a June meeting, but there's no disagreement that it should be on the agenda for discussion. Is that a fair summary? So is there anything else that um, you want to identify now for uh, the 31st? So let me leave it as, as, as I said before. Um, please give careful consideration to whether there are other sections of the budget that you feel need to be um, talked about further, either so that we can have an understanding of what it is that we want to say in our report, or because you might want to consider um, act, actual action and be prepared when we start the meeting on the 31st to talk about that. Um, if not, I think that we um, certainly um, anticipate that we will have discussion about 
what it is that we are going to recommend to the council on the elementary school issue that was raised by the school committee and that we are going to talk about the public safety issues in general um, in order to make sure that we as a committee are comfortable with the response and um, as Kathy actually has done some significant work on this already and um, I think I will need to talk with her about um, whether to just send that to to the committee in advance or um, not, but I'll leave that for a separate conversation. Lynn? I have a, it's a process question. Uh, first of all, on the agenda, uh, even though we may list these three items, can we make sure we list another item that's broad enough that anything can be brought up under the discussion? Uh, and the second is, are we going to be looking at the draft on the 31st or how are we going to complete the draft so it's prepared to go to the council um, in within the required time period? Okay, that's a good question. I'm, I'm just repeat what I said before is the proposal is how to deal with this this year and that is um, to do a brief report to the council on our recommendation for the budget. And I mean, it can be as simple as a page um, saying that we recommend uh, approval of the budget as recommended by the town manager or that we were um, adding in any exceptions that arise from motions on the 31st and that that can be sent so that we meet the 30 day deadline and then um, indicate in that, that there will be a more complete report court forthcoming and um, I was not anticipating at this point scheduling a meeting but if there's a request to schedule a meeting to talk about the draft we can do that otherwise um, I would uh, do the, the report draft in a more similar format to other kinds of reports we've been doing. Michelle? My question is, is right or, or along those same lines. So I remember you saying that we would take our assignments and create some paragraphs or one paragraph for, our, and so what, what exactly would you like to see in that paragraph? I know you, I think you sent an example. Um, and when would you, is that part of the big, bigger report? What's the deadline on that? Basically? That's part of the bigger report. Okay. And um, so, you know, it, it could be, um, like later next week is okay. fine for that, like Wednesday or Thursday. Um, but um, I think that what we really want to do is um, avoid repeating anything that's in the budget itself. Um, you might refer to it, but I don't think we need to repeat what's in the budget because the budget's already been completely written and it's very extensive. Um, but if there's information that we received during presentations that was additional to what is already uh, in the budget book, that that's the key. Uh, so uh, if you posed questions and or answers to questions that uh, it provides additional information that that's the subject matter. And that way uh, we can keep the whole thing briefer all the way through, trying to make sure that, uh, and what I'm gonna do is work on sort of key overarching issues and uh, try and get that draft out fairly quickly so that uh, there's plenty of opportunity to respond to it. Anything else? Okay, so um, to get to the, um, the, I have to see if I can find it quickly, but um, we already posted, uh, or excuse me, not posted. Um, there is, yes, we did post the um, 
we had to post the, the 31st already because um, since Monday is a holiday, it made the posting time requirement um, this morning. So um, Athena's already posted the meeting for uh, next Tuesday. And um, the way that it reads, um, since you may not have it, is that uh, we would start with the public comment after convening the meeting. And the reason for putting public comment at the beginning is that if there are members of the public who want to comment on any um, budget sections, either that we've identified or have not been identified, that um, we really should hear from the public before we um, get into the discussion rather than after under this circumstance. Um, and the, the next item is um, sort of the general um, overall budget review questions discussion item that I have put into every agenda during this last period. And uh, the, the reason is just so that we can continue to have general open discussion about the budget. And the third is um, FY23 budget review, budget recommendations for report process. So those are the items that are on the posted agenda. And it, it is already out there. So anything else? See, uh, seeing that there's no hands up, um, I think that we have completed our business for today and we know what the task is for um, next Tuesday. And uh, uh, once we get past public comment, I think we'll go, we'll start with the, uh, the school budget. So with that, um, we'll consider this meeting adjourned and thank you. Thanks.